Is she with us, Michael? She is. Yep, she's here. She just texted back. Okay. All right, so can we call the, call the meeting to order? Eight o'clock, and I am joined remotely by Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Walner, Mr. Schultz, Mrs. Gonzalez, and we are moving to our first order of business on the agenda, which is Minute. Board member reports. <laughs> How about we start off with you, Mr. O'Leary? Uh, just a couple of things. Now that uh, it appears as though the, the governor's uh, announcement today that we're going to do a phased opening again, just people be, uh, while everybody's anxious, you know, let's just be cautious and move forward cautiously and, you know, uh, follow, follow the suggested rules that have been in place now for a couple of months and uh, hopefully we can beat this thing back and, and get back to some sense of uh, normalcy. And uh, once again, I would like to comment that I think the I think the governor has taken a good measured approach on this whole situation, and I think he's handling it well. And um, I think we should all be grateful uh, for that. Uh, in addition to that, I just wanted to uh, mention uh, a few people who passed away since our last meeting. And again, I know uh, we mentioned uh, Joe Sadlow. Uh, at our last meeting, but uh, this past week's transcript, there was a nice write-up on uh, Joe, World War II veteran and active member of the community. But we've also lost uh, uh, three other people that I want to mention. And one is Nelda Roulard, the other is Bob Downing, and uh, Dot Pecos. Uh, Nelda, for those who've been around town a while, uh, is a local artist, author, parent, volunteer, um, very much engaged with um, the history of our community and also being sure, uh, assuring that uh, our younger students uh, got engaged to, uh, with, the, with the history of our town. She's just a delightful lady, terrific artist, very talented, and you'll see a lot of her works hanging all over town, and just a wonderful person, and lived a nice long life of 99 years, but uh, an active member of the community. Bob Downing, again, was another active member, farming member of our community, but uh, grew up and pretty much spent a lot of time in, in our town here but also uh, expended time and volunteered on the planning board. And Dot Pecos um, was active in a whole host of, uh, of organizations in town, um, not the least of which was our water commissioner. She also helped raise money for uh, the Wilmington Regional Health Center that people from North Reading currently the joint uh, getting services from, and uh, also gave us uh, one of her, her sons, uh, uh, who was former chairman of the board of selectmen here, uh, Kevin Pecos. So again, they were all uh, great contributing members of this community who, who helped shape in, uh, our community and what uh, community we currently enjoy today. A lot of them involved a lot of planning and uh, really uh, good threads and fabric of the community. So again, uh, to their families, our condolences, but uh, we're, we're all should be very grateful for their service to the community. Other than that, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know if we lost Kate. So let's move on to uh, Mrs. Gonzalez. Is it Mr. Walner, can you hear me? Oh, oh, I'll say, Kate, we keep um, I think I'm there. muted on the telephone, Michael. I, okay. I stopped mute. Oh, you are, are you on? You okay? All right. All right. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Walner. I just um, I'm recognizing that um, uh, you know Memorial Day is coming up this weekend, and it's not going to be the traditional. Uh, ceremonies we did like last year, which is my first time being involved formally. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm just trying to think of the current war we're in and the people who are now the people who are on the front and it's our nurses, doctors, you know, staffing people. And I know during the wars, as Memorial Day is for, you know, for veterans who died during war wartime, um, I'm sure there was nurses, doctors and attendants who died during that time. And although we haven't defined a war, um, sure feels like those people are heroes in our current time. So I hope I'm not offending anybody by that, but I can't help but put the two together. So uh, my best to everybody who's um, thinking about Memorial Day and people and their families. And I'm also thinking about the people who are on the front line today. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walner. Mr. Schultz. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have uh, two items. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all the parents of the seniors who put up banners along the football field, on the, right in front of the football field at high school. Every senior has a banner. Uh, I know Al Pereira from Advanced Photo was very instrumental in making that happen as well. And that was program was done by donations from the community, which was great. It looks really good. And I understand the seniors are going to be able to keep their banner when we're done hanging them up there. So class of 2020, you're not forgotten. Um, you know, you guys are going through a lot right now. And you will be a class that will be remembered 30, 40 years from now for sure. Um, I have a, a serious matter I want to discuss. My, my phone was, was blowing up today with texts and messages and calls from the business community. And I want to take a moment to speak from the heart to the business community. I am a small business owner in North Reading, and I've got a, I received a lot of messages and calls from small business owners today. I heard from the Chamber of Commerce, from the executive president. Um, the business community is rightfully furious right now. Governor Baker, I'm sorry, he failed you today. Uh, there is no reason why our small retail brick and mortar stores cannot be open right now, provided they have people wear masks, you limit how many people can go into the store. Why Walmart can be open right now and big box retailers, but yet a small mom and pop on Main Street cannot is just grossly unfair to me. I don't understand why the state is taking such a slow roll right now. If you're going to have Walmart open, let a gift shop open. Let a small store, I'm not going to name names, but a lot of them have called me. And people need to realize when small business owners open a business, they put their heart and soul to it. And they do it for years. When I started my law practice, I worked, I don't know how many hours a day to make it what it is right now. And a lot of these people that open up stores that require fixtures and equipment to run the stores, they put up their personal assets, their homes as collateral, and they're being ruined right now. I got a call from somebody who does personal training and, it, and they deal with just a small number of people. They, well, they're lumped in the same group as Planet Fitness. They're not gonna be open until probably the fall. These people are going to lose their jobs over this. And, and I think the governor, was, it was horrendous with what he put out there today. He failed you people, and I really feel bad for you. The fact that you're going to have the ability to have curbside marijuana deliveries before a small brick-and-mortar retailer can open while Walmart is open, I, I don't know. I don't know on what planet that makes sense. So I, I feel bad for you. We are out for you. I ask the community to please support the small business when and if reopen and the, the service providers. They are really hurting right now, and we are thinking of you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Schultz. All right, Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, I, I'm going to have to support um, Mr. Schultz on those comments, and I'd like to piggyback. Um, I've also gotten some some feedback from the community, and the the one that I was just as shocked at was the car wash. I don't see any rhyme or reason to close down a car wash. You're pretty much by yourself in the car um, or with a family member. You're getting soaped and suds and sterilized and um, you're not interacting with anybody. I mean, if you feel the need to tape up the vacuums, I mean, you're picking up a gas pump. I don't see the difference. But um, to put a small business, let's not forget that if these small businesses don't make it, it affects this entire town. Those are tax dollars, tax revenue. They're people we know, they're people that live here. Um, we don't wanna see small businesses fail. And I know they're in phase one, but it's not immediate. And I just think it's a little silly. Um, and I'd also like to just do a shout out. I, I, I mean, I'm gonna piggyback on to Mr. Walner, but um, a little shout out to because of Mr. O'Leary and I, our kids who are out there on the front lines um, and all the police and fire that are out there. Um, you know, the, they're getting exposed to things and it's a little scary out there for them too. So I just wanna give them a little shout out too. That's all. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Schultz. I mean, excuse me, oh, Mrs. Wow. Gonzalez, I'm married. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. And I just want to, um, you know, I can start out with, I, I actually appreciate the effort that was made by the governor. I understand that this is a really difficult time. We've never been through this. We ourselves as a town are trying to sort through what we need to do. 
how to reopen, how to, uh, you know, engage in the phased approach. It's a measured approach. I also think we need to have and hear from members of the community who own small businesses. Give us the plan. Let's hear it. Maybe we do have establishments that can open in their parking lot and serve, and we need to hear from you. We need to know what you think is a viable plan with the institution of all of those um, measures that are in place, so safety protocols in place. I think we need to hear from people um, and and see what their plan is. And I know there's a checklist and you can go online. We'll have our COVID-19 update from our town administrator shortly, but um, it's, a, it's really important for everybody to put, you know, to get together and try to help come up with a pathway and a plan and I appreciate the fact that the plan that's being unfurled, even if it's a little bit slow, and even if it's phased in a in a way that we would we would want it to be more quickly taken care of, but it's it's a, actually based upon the DPH and the medical information that's being presented. And you know, let's not forget it's a pandemic, and they're trying to prevent infection, and and so. I think that we can definitely have business members or those individuals that are reaching out to us participate in that process. And I think it would help us have, if we saw this plan or this information or some, you know, little bit of common sense guided by the safety protocols in place. Um, but I do appreciate that at least there's a phased approach, there's a, an attempt made there's never been a time like this before. So it's brand new to everybody working on it. Um, that's the second thing is I too wanted to say thank you. I really wanted to thank Al Pereira of Advanced Photo and the um, parents group that put together those banners, um, fully paid for, not a senior had to pay for the banner. We went out there with our son, who's a senior. A couple of us have seniors. A couple of us on the board have seniors. And I think it was the first occasion these students have been together since um, they were sent home in March. Some of them, it's the first occasion where they've actually been together and it finally settled in with them. I think that, you know, that time, the time has already passed for them. So it was kind of a melancholy, but really amazing way to, for them to be, um, thought of by the town uh, as a parent. I, I'm so appreciative of that, that effort. I can't even explain how amazing I, I amazing it was for us as parents to, to get together with our kids and see what the town has done for them to commemorate this, you know, and, and Mr. Schultz is right. This is going to be an amazingly resilient generation, but if there's things like this that we can, commemorate their last year. I think it was so special. So I, I, I so appreciate what everyone has done and thank uh, Mr. Pereira for uh, being out there videotaping. Thank the police officers for setting the banners up and setting the place up for us and the parents groups for being out there to help us through. And then my last thing is it's Memorial Day. It's the day for us to remember our veterans who have um, you know, Pat passed away in the line of duty, protecting us now more than ever with everything that we're living through as a community and everything that we're living through as a nation. Our freedoms are so important to us and the people that laid down their lives to fight for us. Uh, it's so important for us to commemorate them. NORCAM, even though we're doing something different, NORCAM is still going to be putting together um, a video montage um, to commemorate the day so that we at least mark the day with something special for for veterans, for, for our veterans who who passed. Um, and that is about it. So next order of business, I think, is our uh, public comment. Michael, do we have anyone here for public comment? Uh, I'm not seeing any hands either by image or electronically being raised. All right. So then we're going to move to the minutes, May 4th, regular and executive session minutes. Madam Chair, I move to approve the May 4th, 2020 regular session minutes as written. Second. 
I have a motion by Mrs. Gonzalez and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Schultz. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manupelli is aye. So it's unanimous. Madam Chair, I move to approve the May 4, 2020 executive session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion by Mrs. Gonzalez and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Schultz. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manny Pelli is aye. Next order of business is a COVID-19 update. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. The only thing I, I, I'll offer this evening is that um, we have been monitoring the information that's been released by the state over the course of the day today. We had a uh, COVID-19 working group meeting late this afternoon to try to discuss implementation of some of the steps for municipal services here in, uh, in North Reading and that that work will continue uh, at a follow-up meeting scheduled for tomorrow morning and that we will publish more information for the town regarding things like any changes at our parks or at our municipal buildings or concerning municipal services um, as soon as, uh, as we're able to. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, and Mr. Gilberto, you are posting regular updates as well for everyone um, on the town's website. So Correct. if people want more updated information or further information, you can check our website and the um, the Massachusetts website also has some of the more recent COVID-19 executive orders and the phase in plan and the PowerPoint presentation too for people that want more information. They can also consult with the state um, mass.gov website. All right, so is that is that it, um, Mr. Gilberto, just on that COVID-19? We are posting to the website. We're also posting to a Facebook page um, known as North Reading Town Hall. Um, we've moved to a weekly updates on the case information for COVID-19 to Thursdays now, but we'll be doing um, updates in between as needed with any other information as it relates to the community. And um, a question on that I have, are you seeing the numbers um, sort of maintaining or increasing or what, what are you seeing in terms of the numbers? It, it seemed that as of the last update on Thursday that the, num the rate of increase may have been slowing. Um, but again, you know, time will tell with the information as it's released um, in the upcoming days. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Do the members have questions? Mr. O'Leary? Uh, just uh, questions and comments. And, I, and maybe Comment, the town, yes. Right, maybe the yeah. town administrator can comment on it too. I mean, I, I know the Board of Health is uh, working overtime. <laughs> mm -hmm. The health inspectors are very busy, but I mean, the Board of Health has also been very busy too. And I think just in relation to, you know, some of the, uh, the comments that were made and, you know, how this whole thing is being phased in. I mean, it is based on the science and the numbers and you know, some, uh, there may be some oversight uh, or some businesses overlooked that could have been included in certain phases, there's no doubt about it. But uh, my concern and comment would be, you know, if there's something we can do here locally that safely can, can assist in uh, the better servicing the public safely, you know, and for instance, you know, I did, I, I did um, participate last week in one of the Board of Health uh, meetings, just to take a look at, you know, it, there's a limit of 10 people that can go into say CVS, it's 14,000 square feet. And there's 10 people limit that can go into the convenience store diagonally across the street that can't, 10 people can't safely distance in the store. You know, if the Board of Health at the, the local level, and I, and I don't have the answer, you know, how much latitude, you know, does the Board of Health have and the town of North Reading have in making sure that uh, it works a little bit better, a little bit more smoothly, you know, CVS can handle more than 10 people. Uh, some of the other businesses can too. You know, if we have that ability, you know, maybe we should, you know, take a look at it and have the health, health agent take a look at it, you know, through the uh, public safety director and the town administration and across it with the, with the Board of Health. 
And again, just to help facilitate, I don't like seeing senior. I went into CVS the other morning at about 11 o'clock in the morning. I, I walked right in, which was fine. But when I came out, there was five or six people standing outside and it was chilly and cold. And I would say, honestly, the average age was probably 83. Um, and there was plenty of room in the store where people could have, you know, safely gone in and kept their distance. So again, we would need to just put a little bit of common sense um, if we can, if we can exercise that. Uh, but again, overall, again, I think our administration is doing a great job of keeping us well informed and um, keeping the public well informed. And I think the Board of Health has been acting responsibly. Uh, but I just think if we have this uh, opportunity, instead of just flat numbers, 10, 10 across the board, we have some flexibility. Let's, let's utilize it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner, any questions, comments, all set? Mr. Schultz? I just want to speak real quick. I, Mr. O'Leary, I do agree with you that we should help whenever we can. I do want to give you some feedback on CVS, though. They have asked to only have 10 people because a lot of these businesses are having staffing problems right now. They can't have a crowd, manage a crowd bigger than that in CVS. The manager has asked us to keep it at 10% directly. Um, the other issue is there are businesses in town, like McDonald's was closed for a little while because they couldn't get enough employees to work because employees are making more sitting at home when they get that $600 a week stimulus check. So there's a lot of well-intended programs out there that are having a negative effect on employers being able to maintain employees. And those two examples are, are why we have to limit, well, McDonald's is just takeout, but CVS, they have totally asked us specifically, we don't want more than 10. So I just want to make sure you had the feedback on that. From that. It just is my understanding the CVS uh, network wide is really at about 40. Right? So I'm not aware that the, the local manager asked for 10, but uh, my, my information told me otherwise. Uh, yeah. feedback that I, got. I know there was the landlord advocated on their behalf at the Board of Health meeting last week, but I did hear from, I had heard that CVS indicated they never asked them to do that. So I don't know what's going on over there, but I do know they have a limited staff and that they can't really manage a big crowd so I, you know to get more businesses open we're going to have to have these limits and it's going to be the new normal and it's we got to get all these businesses going i mean we got to get business going in north Reading. okay thank you mr schultz mrs gonzalez yeah just to touch on that thought process with things starting to open um there are towns that are looking at um helping the restaurants out by letting them put tables out on the sidewalks, letting them use their parking areas, um, which would normally in regular times not be okay. But for this time, um, it's a great idea. Hanover Street in the North End is considering shutting down the road to traffic and allowing the restaurants to put tables out there. Um, Beverly is, is looking at sidewalk tables. Um, I think it's something that we should look at. The, the horseshoe has plenty of parking area, the, the China Cuisine does. Um, there's several restaurants who have plenty of parking area that they maybe could utilize as outside seating with the good weather coming. And so I think that would just be a, a thought to put out there. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. I, I mean, I agree. Right now we're in, you know, the phase one, which is the construction and the manufacturing and the places of worship, right? So as, you know, phase two and phase three and phase four approach, even though restaurants aren't at full service yet, at some point they're going to be resuming that full service. And there's no better time than the present for people to, you know, let's hear from the businesses as to, how they can. We don't know what they're struggling with. CVS is a good example. They are obviously struggling with not having a full staff that, that wants to be in there to work. And, you know, how do they keep their customers safe and their staff safe and all that? I think it's going to require a lot of input by the business community as to what they can and can't do. And of course, uh, are, are, are assuring that they're complying our officials assuring that they're complying with the requirements in the plan that's been presented, providing their, uh, you know, their employees with the protective equipment, et cetera. And I think there's definitely a significant amount of discretion that we need to use to be able to be 
to be mindful of this balance between preventing it, the spread of it, but also not, you know, decimating businesses in our community who can comply and who can make things as safe as possible. So I think at some point we're going to have to have some some more input, but I also do appreciate the the uh, tremendous amount of effort we have. Our city officials are working around the clock to to try to work on all of this stuff, and no one's ever been here before. So they're basically carving a path for how to with something that we we, we have never experienced in our time. So um, I think that if there's anything else, nothing else, Mr. Gilberto, we can move on to the next item, which is. Uh, signing the bond anticipation notes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We are joined this evening with the town treasurer, Mary Ann McKay. Um, and uh, to the clerk, Mrs. Gonzalez, you should have an email from me from um, shortly before six o'clock PM with a fairly detailed uh, motion for um, what the board needs to vote. Um, you'll be voting to approve this short-term borrowing in a revised motion that includes a reference to the board electronically signing off on the paperwork. So that's a change from how we historically have handled um, this type of borrowing. Um, you had in your packet a summary of what was being um, borrowed um, and the interest rates, the low interest rate being 0.9110% from Piper Sandler and Company, which was recommended to be awarded the sale. And uh, the total temporary borrowing um, bond anticipation notes was $8.913 million, $8,913,380 for a variety of water, uh, middle high school projects, uh, public works, fire, library building, and um, uh, uh, roadway construction as well. Um, we have prepared a motion and um, to the town treasurer, if I misstated anything, certainly correct me. If not, there's a motion before the board. Nope, you, um, we did have five bids, um, so that was, a, that was good that we actually did end up getting five bids. Um, but nope, everything that you said um, is correct. Okay. I see the finance director is on as well. Liz, is there anything that you wish to add? No, there is not. Members have any questions? Mr. O'Leary? No questions. Mr. Walner? Mr. Walner? All set, Mr. Schultz. All set, Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, All set. Yeah. Okay. No. Okay. Do we? Do I have a motion? So that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> I can read forward it to you, Leanne, if you'd like. Yeah, I, I have the whole. I mean, where it just, um, Madam Chair, I move that the board take the following actions. Is that what I'm reading? That whole. That's correct. Okay, I have that. And I have the updated one that you sent, so. Sure, so in the body of the email, if you just read from Madam Chair down through the last further yep. voted line, that's sufficient. Okay, great. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the board take the following actions. Voted to approve the sale of an eight million nine hundred thirteen thousand three hundred eighty two percent general obligation bond anticipation notes of the town dated May 28, 2020 and payable May 28, 2021 to Piper Sandler and Company at par and accrued interest, if any, plus a premium of 97,066.71. Further voted that in connection with the marketing and sale of the notes, the preparation and distribution of a notice of sale and prelim preliminary official statement dated May 6, 2020, and a final official statement dated May 12, 2020, each in such form as may be approved by the town treasurer, be and hereby are ratified, confirmed, approved, and adopted. Further voted that the town treasurer and the select board be and hereby are authorized to execute and deliver a significant events disclosure undertaking in compliance with SEC rule 15C2-12 in some form as may be approved by the bond council to the town, which undertaking shall be incorporated by reference in the notes for the benefit of the holders, the notes from time to time. Further voted that we authorize and direct the town treasurer to establish post issuance federal tax compliance procedure and continuing disclosure procedures in such forms as the town treasurer and bond council deem sufficient 
or if such procedures are currently in place to review and update such procedures in order to monitor and maintain the tax exempt status of the notes and to comply with relevant security laws. Further voted that any certificates or documents relating to the notes collectively, the documents may be executed in several counterparts, each of which shall be regarded as an original and all of which shall con constitute one and the same document. Delivery of an executed counterpart of a signature page to a document by electronic mail in a PDF file or by other electronic transmission shall be as effective as delivery of a manually executed counterpart signature page to such document and electronic signatures on any of the documents shall be deemed original signatures for the purpose of the documents and all matters relating thereto, having the same legal effect as original signatures. Further voted that each member of the select board, the town clerk and the town treasurer be and hereby are authorized to take any and all such actions and execute any deliver such certificates, receipts, or other documents as may be determined by them or any of them to be necessary or convenient to carry into effect the provision of the foregoing votes. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Madam Chair. Mr. Chair. Gilberto. I would just ask to the town treasurer. So that was a modified version that was sent by Karen to me uh, early this morning. I, I pasted the language into the standard motion that we use. I just want to make sure that that's correct. Um, I had sent Karen the, um, the new motion that um, Locke and Lloyd had sent me. So if that was the same one, then it should be fine. So it was an email from um, early this morning that, that was uh, forwarded to me by Karen. Um, just checking the time on that. It looks like it was sent to me at 826 this morning and sent by you at 928 a.m. Saturday morning. Correct. That's Is that right. correct? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. I have a motion by Mrs. Gonzalez and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion, Mr. O'Leary? Any further discussion? No, ma'am. Thank no. you. Mr. Walner, any further discussion? Oh. Mr. Schultz, any further discussion? No. Mrs. Gonzalez, any further discussion? No. Nope. Okay. We're going to move, move to a vote. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Schultz. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. It's unanimous. Our Next order of business. Is Capital Improvement Planning Committee review and approval of the fiscal year 2021 funding recommendations. And we have Mrs. Herbert and Mr. Kelleher here. Mr. Gilberta, do you want to begin? And then uh, we can defer to the team? Sure. I think I'll turn it right over to Mr. Kelleher, the uh, chair Perfect. of the committee, who has put quite a bit of work into the plan over the past few years, including um, this very challenging year. So, Don? Okay. Th thank you. Uh, it is a fairly brief report, not the, the typical report that we, we normally give with, with uh, recommendations for, for the obvious reasons, that uh, the uncertainty in, in, in funding of, from, from the state and local receipts uh, after reviewing all of the the uh, proposals that we received um, and and as I mentioned in the the uh, memo that I sent you which I believe you have in your package we received over six million dollars in requests from the municipal and and, and schools uh, another uh, 2.3 from uh, water enterprise and 220,000 from Hillview uh, and we, we went through all of the same process that we normally do of uh, talking with the department heads, uh, getting um, justification for why their requests were there, going out and doing a field trip and looking at you know vehicles or, or uh, facilities that needed some either replacement or upgrades. 
uh, ranked everything, um, and then sat back and said, "This is this is this is too much for this year," and asked through Mike um, to have the department heads go back again and tell us not what was they would like to have or what they they need, but what was what was critical, what what would keep them from completing the missions that they're, 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 they've been assigned and they've undertaken. Um, and so with that um, next review, it, it got it down to a, a handful of items. Um, in the, uh, the municipal and school departments, um, um, the major piece in there is the replacement of the boiler in town hall. Uh, it's a fairly big ticket item, it's $350,000, um, but we're living on borrowed time. That boiler is, is 60 years old, it's original to the building. Uh, we've had it on our, our list of um, items to be watching for the last several years. It, it, we haven't been looking to recommend it, but kept keeping our fingers crossed because it was such an expensive item. Um, originally in the earlier, uh, iterations of the uh, the, the capital requests in, in prior years had a price tag of of nine hundred thousand um, dollars. Through the 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 good work of, of Pat Bauer and, and Mark Hamill, they found a a, a, a solution to it, which the, one of the bigger costs of of replacing that boiler is taking the old one out because it has to be dis dismantled or the wall on the building has to be knocked down. Um, there's obviously asbestos in it, so there's got to be a significant abatement that would go on. And they came up with the idea of just encapsulating it and wrapping it like you would a boat um, and leaving it in place, uh, disconnecting it, leaving it in place, um, and replacing it outside of that area with uh, three smaller uh, units um, with a total cost of about $350,000. Um, we thought that was a, a, a good solution um, um, and that, that eventually we'll have to deal with removing the boiler, but that won't come um, unless and until we're, we're, we're doing something with the building and something will come out of the uh, facilities uh, 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 capital program. Um, so that one we recommended and thought we needed to do it. Uh, it will be bonded. Uh, ultimately bonded, it would be an item that we can for for the first year. Uh, it would have to be bonded in about a year, a year and a half from now. Um, the other items include two two vehicles, uh, uh, two trucks that the uh, one in the school department and one in DPW. Uh, school department needs to replace an aging F three fifty with a newer newer version of it and DPW needs to replace a Ford Ranger, uh, a smaller vehicle with, with an F-50. These cost about $50,000 a piece, so there's, there's $100,000. Uh, we expect that we'll be able to acquire those with, uh, with, with, uh, uh, with, with free cash funding. Uh, the final item in the, in the municipal and school uh, area uh, came from the, the fire department and it was to, um, to purchase a stretcher load system retrofit for what is now ambulance number one, which will become ambulance number two when the, when the new one arrives. And the reason they, they wanted to do this is that the, the system that, that is going to be in the new ambulance when it comes will be this, this more modern, uh, easy on the back, um, uh, system to load um, uh, patients on and off of the the ambulance. Having the same system working on both um, makes it easier to um, stay current on training and not ha have to uh, 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 perhaps risk injury in going from one system to the other and and not not uh, being being aware of it in an emergency. We thought this made made a lot of sense. It's not a big ticket item. It's only thirty six thousand, almost thirty seven thousand dollars, and it can be paid for out of the ambulance fund. So that would not come out of the the, the operating budget. So those are the four items that that we've recommended. 
um, with respect to the question. No, with respect to the the enterprise um, funds, the uh, Hillview is proposed about two hundred and twenty thousand dollars worth of equipment, um, and we're comfortable in recommending that knowing full well that if if the golf season doesn't produce the revenue necessary uh, to actually do all of this that uh, the the Hillview Commission will would, wouldn't go forward with them and and they've also need to be approved by by the the uh, town administrator in any event so people went crazy and and, and ordered them or want to buy them and afford them then that that could cut back Water Enterprise, as I said, they had originally looked for um, $2.3 million. Um, when we went back and looked at what the critical needs were there, there were, there were three um, some updates to the, uh, the water distribution system and a couple of pieces of equipment that are aged, aging equipment that needs, needs to be replaced, an excavator, and again, a Ford F-350. Um, total of with those three items of about $363,000. And again, that would be paid for out of the enterprise. Uh, the last item that we, we talked about and, and, and struggled with was the road program. As, as you know, we've been, been pushing pretty hard over the last several years to get some significant upgrade to the, uh, the, the, the roadway system in town. And, DPW came came up with a multi-year plan which we, we fully endorsed um, that took neighborhoods and clusters of streets within those neighborhoods and as an, as an efficient way of of uh, rehabbing the the roadways. Uh, one was completed last year, and um, the next one that was scheduled for this year would have cost nearly $1.7 million to, to get it done. Um, part of that money was going to come from uh, Chapter 70 funds, uh, excuse me, Chapter 90 funds, um, would have been about $520,000. Uh, there was some money left over from, from last year um, that we didn't, didn't need and could be applied to it. And then in the capital plan itself, we were planning on recommending $600,000 uh, be bonded. Um, and then hopefully we'd be have enough money in free cash to make up the difference. Um, after going through the, the, uh, the budget and where we think we're gonna have some shortfalls in, in, uh, in, in revenue, uh, we felt it just wasn't wasn't prudent to go ahead and recommend the 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 full amount that's going to be done for was being requested for this this grouping of streets, and um, a recommending that we limit this year's um, work to the amount of money we're going to get from Chapter seventy, Chapter ninety. I keep saying Chapter seventy. I'm glad nobody from the school committee is listening to me. They wouldn't appreciate that at all. And, and the two hundred thousand dollars that is left over from last year, and then just delay these the the completion of that project a year, and it, it may move the whole program out a year or move it out a part of a year if we can do next year if we're in better shape and we can finish this this section and start on the other. We may over some time get ourselves back on schedule, but to um, uh, Commit to to uh, bonding uh, six hundred thousand dollars and the and the the debt service that would go along with that, and using um, free cash, um, which is is a scarce commodity and will be a scarce commodity this year. We didn't think that made made any sense at all. So we're not recommending doing anything more than the money that is uh, on hand. Um, what were our plan? is to keep meeting um, over, over the, the, the rest of this year with the hopes of being able to come back uh, to the select board prior to the October town meeting. And if funds are available, if things are, have gotten better, and that's a huge if, uh, then we would perhaps recommend some, some of the deferred items from the fiscal 21 uh, 
capital uh, requests and the capital plan, but um, that, as I say, is a huge if. So all we're, we're recommending tonight are the, the four items that I mentioned um, from the municipal and school department and the items from the two enterprise funds. And that's it. And I think most of the people on the committee are on this 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 uh, Zoom, uh, with the exception of uh, Diana Boutwell, Mike Mike Conley, who are over doing their own thing at the school department, and uh, Joe Fody, who's who's not been terribly active in the uh, in the uh, uh, the committee this year for 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 some some personal reasons. Um, but that's it. That's our report and. Uh, it's up to, we recommend that, that uh, the, the uh, select board uh, approve it. Thank you, Mr. Kelleher. Now I'm gonna just go to the members to make sure that does anyone have any questions? Um, Mr. O'Leary? No, just a comment that again, that I had the benefit of sitting with Mr. Kelleher and the rest of the committee there for a couple of years and they put an awful lot of work and effort and uh, slicing and dicing things and helping uh, department heads prioritize and. Uh, spend efficiently and I think it's a wise move and I appreciate the effort that's been put in and I appreciate the recommendation that's being made. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner, any questions or yeah. comments? Or Just a comment. Okay. Question. Um, yeah, I think that obviously I think you've done a great job of kind of sorting through the priorities. The one I'm still choking on is the new boiler for the town hall simply because I think that there's, you know, on the master facilities plan, there's a good chance the town hall may not be here in five years. Um, so just hate seeing us put that kind of money into a town hall that um, may not be here. But anyways, it is what it is, I guess. I mean, if there's a even cheaper way of achieving the goal with a shorter life unit, it might be prudent. But um, that's the only comment I have. Otherwise, I think you did a great job. Thank you. Mr. Shaw. I had the pleasure of serving on this committee and it is one of my favorites. Uh, Mr. Wallen, to your question, and Mr. Kelleher, please correct me. I thought the presentation on the boiler that it would be movable to another building. That's what we've been told, yes. Yeah, so Rich, we'd be able to use it in a new building. Oh. Yeah, we had the same questions as well. Thank you, I'm all in then. Thank you, I like the sound of that. <laughs> yeah, as far as this year, it was a struggle because we did our normal, I don't know, when we started last year sometime, we started going through all the different departments we're basically nearing the end also of COVID-19 hits, right around the time where we were just kind of like coming up with the final numbers. And and I want to thank everybody on the on the committee. It's we really had to shift gears and and things like the road program, which we have promised the citizens that we're gonna get ahead on. And we, we had a program in place that we're gonna really get ahead on maintenance for each year. We're gonna have to take a year off and see where we're at on that. And I just want to thank again uh, Mr. Kelleher, uh, Ms. Berg, Ms. Herbert. You know, you guys have done a great job on this for years and uh, it was tricky this year. There was no doubt about it. But I, we're doing the best we can. Is the best thing I can say right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Mrs. Gonzalez, any questions, comments? No questions. Just you know, like my colleagues, I'm thanking the committee for all the hard work they do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. And I too had the pleasure of. Uh, working with the committee this year and it, this was no easy task and I think this is the time that highlights these volunteers that spend their time year after year after year after year after year like Mr. Kelleher like Mrs. Hurlbut on these committees are invaluable to us as we move forward in a predicament we have never been in before and we really rely on that institutional knowledge that financial acumen and and that just that historical knowledge um, to help guide us so i really appreciate everyone on that committee's assistance but especially those people that have been volunteers on that committee for all of these years because it's invaluable service to us um, so i think that's about it i don't know if there's anyone anyone else we're all set and ready to vote I think. Do I have a motion? Yes. Madam Chair, I move to approve the FY 2021 capital expenditures as recommended by the Capital Improvement Planning Committee. Second. 
We have a motion by Mrs. Gonzalez and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Schultz. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. The unanimous. Thank you again for all your work on this. Okay, our next order of business is to review the fiscal year 2021 tax exemptions and deferrals and uh, members, it's on page 37, but we'll go with you, Mr. Gilberto. You wanna do a rundown of that or? Just a very, very brief introduction. This is a, an issue that was brought to my attention by Mr. O'Leary um, coming across this, uh, other, other work, I believe, and um, there's a timely uh, you know deadline that's upcoming that the assessor is joining us here this evening with regard to um, both in terms of a potential pro a program that may be available to some residents, as well as some potential adjustments, I believe, to that program that may also be able to be made. Um, I guess, if, Madam Chair, through you, Mr. O'Leary, would you like to add anything else with regard to introduction? Or uh, I just had an inquiry from a constituent. Uh, well, a week or so ago as to you know what was available to her um, and, I, and I didn't have all the answers I, I knew that we had uh, we had programs in place but I also knew that they were uh, rarely utilized and I'm sp speaking specifically to the uh, deferments not necessarily the exemptions because I think the veterans agent does a fine job of making sure that those that are eligible for uh, veterans benefits you know get them and uh, encourage them to apply for it so it's more of the um, the deferrals that I was interested in finding out, and I think uh, talking with the uh, with the assessor, uh, Deb Carbone, that you know the timeliness of this is is pretty good. It's, it's a bit, well, it's it's now or never. Uh, the deadline's been pushed out to June first, where people can apply for it, and uh, I just thought it would be appropriate for um, presentation to be made to the board this meeting, you know, so to give people a couple of weeks to uh, to contemplate whether or not they wanted to participate or whether they were even eligible. Then also in reviewing uh, the guidelines from what I was able to, to glean, uh, some of the income limits and things seemed extraordinarily low and maybe we have an opportunity to, uh, to adjust those. But I thought uh, so too. Deb was going to uh, look into all of that and give us a presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon guys, or good evening actually. I did have an opportunity to come up with the guidelines that are in place. Currently, the income limit is $20,000. Excuse me, this is for the deferrals, not the exemptions? For the deferrals. Okay. That's, that's all that I'm, I'm speaking on. So the $20,000 limit can actually be changed at town meeting. We wouldn't have time to do it for the June, but we could look at doing it for October. So that being said, the other option is if the taxpayer has filed their income taxes with the circuit breaker, then we would take the income limits from the circuit breaker amount. And that's based on the single, so that moves the income limit up to 60000 So when they fill out the application, they do have to, you know, provide their documentation, such as their birth certificates, their incomes, their assets. And with all that submitted by June 1st, because I... It, that is the hard fast deadline we can if they filed the circuit breaker we can use the sixty thousand dollars as opposed to the 20. and then fast forward we can look at increasing for the town can adopt a higher limit in october unless i don't think we could change it for the june warrant Does that make sense? Could we? Is it too late? 
So the warrant has not been signed. The select board won't sign it until June 1st. Um, how the, the financial mechanisms and, and that type of timing works, that I, I have to defer to the assessor or to the finance director. So the way financially that would work is the deferment is just that. It's a deferment on their real estate taxes. They can defer 100% of their taxes annually, or they can choose to defer a portion. It's entirely up to them. So if they want to defer 5,000 like in their total annual taxes or 10,000, that is an option for them. That is at an 8% interest rate. And at such time of either selling their home or upon you know their passing that does have to be paid if it's not then it does switch over to a 16 percent interest rate so but that's kind of going a little ahead of what needs to be done but i want the taxpayers to know you know that is it is a lien on their property at eight percent interest Madam Chair, through you, I yeah, think, you thank you. I think the question is out there and, you know, uh, we have, this is something that came up on Thursday that we have not had the time to, um, to exhaust, uh, exhaustively research, but Deb has done quite a bit of work. I think the question is to, to the assessor or to the finance director, is this a, a program, an adjustment to the program, the income level that is, that we could make in, if we got it on the warrant in June, is it something that would be effective now or is it something that would be you know would need to be delayed in terms of its effective date both for processing the deferrals and for any adjustments that you may have to make to our revenue plan for it um and if, i know we can't discuss that offline but is it an option as long as it was done before the new fiscal year their applications that are due in the office by june 1st 2020 are for this fiscal year. So wouldn't have any kind of financial burden change for this year. So if it went on the warrant, it would be accepted for their current applications. Um, I, I just have, I think I have a follow-up to that too. And I, I wanted to actually ask you basically what financial impact have you projected this will have on our local tax receipts so it, it what percentage of our taxpayers would be eligible for this deferral and how would that reduce the tax our tax receipts what have you projected with regard to that in in all honesty i have not done any kind of projection i don't know how many you know would apply how many would qualify uh, you know, that would take some time. I can tell you the program has been in effect and traditionally we do have one to two taxpayers say a year that do inquire uh, about it because we do have a complete little cheat sheet on our counter that includes exemptions and the deferral is on there too. Traditionally, once we explain the program that after it's accepted by the Board of Assessors and then it is a lien on their home, they traditionally do not return the application or they say, I'm not interested right now. So I really wouldn't feel comfortable giving a projection um, on how many would be, you know, speculative and qualifying on that. So, but so right now at the twenty thousand dollar income limit, you don't do you I mean, without obviously how many how many avail themselves of this? You're saying none, no one does, because it's an 8% interest rate that gets attached to that? Hey, can you repeat that, Kate? You Please. have it available, the program, the deferral program is already available up Correct. to a specific 
up to the twenty thousand dollar limit. Exactly. Then it's obviously for a real uh, an owner of real estate because it's a deferral on the payment of the real estate tax. Yes. And it's a deferral for is it's a deferral until they either sell their parcel or they pass away and the city would the town would be obtaining the repayment based on a sale transaction of the real estate, right? Correct. Yeah. So at an eight percent per year interest rate. Yes. So right now with that program in effect for um lower income our lower income population which is the twenty thousand dollar income rate how many taxpayers avail themselves of that program i again i don't you know if they don't apply i don't know what their incomes are i can tell you our exemptions and i'm not talking the veterans exemptions i'm talking our senior exemptions our blind exemptions we don't really have for what i know for the applications we currently have annually with taxpayers in that twenty thousand dollar bracket so and you don't have anyone that that's in the deferral program that's what i'm asking you oh, right now you don't have no, any no no we okay don't. even at the, the the lower income level we don't have anyone participating in the deferral program no if right? we have and we have not had an applicant since 2000 i want to say nine all and right but you still one. you still when they apply they they're most likely eligible for the other exemptions that that are available Correct. So what that's what, what I'm hearing you say, right? Yes. So yes. Okay. When we have a taxpayer come into our office, we go through the other exemptions because mm -hmm. even if they did choose to go for the deferral, if they qualify for a senior exemption and they can get five hundred dollars off their taxes, we're gonna offer both of those. We're not gonna offer just a deferral we will go through and see what else they can qualify for. So currently, when they come in, they may qualify for the senior exemption. And then when we look and discuss the tax deferral, they traditionally, you know, walk away, like I said, as soon as we say a lien. And you know, if I don't have their income information, I don't know if they qualify for the deferral. Mm -hmm. I can tell you a lot of our surrounding communities do not have uh, taxpayers in the deferral program either. I can speak for Middleton. We haven't had one in there in probably 10 years either. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did uh, the members have any? I just want to make sure. Hey, anyone else have any questions? Mr. O'Leary, you all set? Oh, Mr. No, O'Leary. No, I'm not all set because I, I just think, it, first of all, I, I think we don't have a lot of participants in this program. And again, all, all of us have, uh, have stated over the years that we, we want to do something for the long term residents who are, uh, you know, uh, land rich and cash poor and want to, you know, age in the community. And obviously, with the uh, rising uh, cost of operating our community, our tax and our tax rate being what it is, you know, it, it's a significant portion of people's income to just pay the, the real estate taxes here. And for those people who are on fixed incomes or those that have their pensions tied up, particularly right now in the stock market, uh, with a, take a significant dive, uh, which was the case of the person who gave me a call, uh, it was concerned, you know, as to how are we going to be able to stay in age in place and, and Pay the real estate taxes were there any programs available so what i started looking into it you know the income limit of twenty thousand uh, dollars certainly doesn't uh, lend itself to an awful lot of people rendering themselves eligible for any of the programs or even holding on to their holding on to their homes you know so i think an adjustment needs to be made to be more realistic and i know that the uh, this uh, state statute allows for um, us going up to 
the circuit breaker limit, which is sixty thousand dollars for a single individual and ninety thousand dollars for a couple, you know that would render a significant number of people eligible, you know, for considering it. Again, most people who live in their homes like this, you know, want to leave their homes to their kids, or you know, don't necessarily mm -hmm. want to encumber it. But uh, but people shouldn't have to live like paupers and you know to pay their real estate tax bills. So they should be able to use the asset. And again, that's a decision they have to make along with their. Uh, the children or advisor, financial advisors. But I think we need to provide an opportunity for people to stay and age in the community in their home that they've been in for a number of years. Um, I also believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Deb, that, you know, I don't know if it's town meeting or the board, it has an opportunity to also adjust the, the interest rate as well as the income. That, rates. that is correct. It's town yeah. meeting. Yeah, all right. So again, the interest rates can be set. Um, right now it's currently at 8% at a $20,000 income level. Um, also, it's important to note that the uh, statute also requires that uh, the deferrals can't be any more than 50% of the value of the property itself. So if the home yes, is- that is correct. So if the home is assessed for $400,000, you can only put a you defer up to $200,000. So that's, that's all of the equity, all of the equity in the home is not eaten up by, by the taxes, um, by the taxes. So, you know, I just think it's a program that um, it's timely. Uh, it's something that hasn't been addressed in a long period of time because there hasn't been a, a large demand. And I believe there's not a demand for it because the income limits are so low and don't make it reasonable and functional. So if we really are uh, going to put our money where our mouth is, where we want to see people age in the community and stay here and uh, remain you know, valuable uh, members of the community, um, and be able to utilize the, uh, the value of the asset. I think we should be able we should be able to uh, to do something at this June town meeting to offer some sort of an adjustment. We may choose not to go all the way up to the circuit breaker limit because again that would render a significant number of people eligible, and that may adversely impact our, our revenue collections. Uh, and we may want to take a look at it incrementally. In other words, you know, take an incremental step, you know, up it to forty thousand dollars, and see what happens, see what the interest level is. And as it, as it creeps up, we'll be able to, uh, to take a look and see if people are gonna be taking advantage of it and wanna, wanna do it. But I, I think it's time for us to, to take a look at it, um, make some sort of adjustments, provide some opportunities for our long um, time residents to, to age in place and uh, provide them with an opportunity to, to defer their, their tax. And again, we're gonna be getting it with interest. So it's, the income's gonna be deferred, but it's with interest. And uh, right. I think it would even itself out uh, over over time. So I, I think you know, I think we should put an article on the on the June town meeting warrant if it's the majority of the boards in favor of it, and uh, and take a look at what the what the income limits should be. We can have another discussion on that. Okay, Steve, I do I agree a hundred percent with the you know population oh. of our aging citizens in the town of North Reading and helping them out every way possible. And that's why I really want to reiterate again, if they were to come into my office and fill out that application, most of them are filling out a circuit breaker. So the circuit breaker, if we, we can take that number, so we can help them this year, whether we choose, whether the board chooses to go to the 40,000 in town meeting, or whether we choose to go with the circuit breaker. And it, it is really time to make that change. And you, we can do something for this year. I didn't, uh, again, maybe I misread it. I mean, my understanding was, you know, we have a limited, it's $20,000, but we could go up to the circuit breaker limits under the statute if the, legislative, if the, if the legislative body adopts it. That's correct. So in other words, if someone applies right now, they're not eligible for the circuit breaker amount unless town meeting takes appropriate action. Right. And looking at June town meeting, we are still within that fiscal year. Right. So no, I understand that you know, timing wise, we can do it. I, I, correct. I'm advocating that we should, you know, mm -hmm. whether it should be that 60 and $90,000 figure is, is what I might be questioning a bit because of a, uh, the impact on collection of revenues as a first step, how many people would participate, you know, I don't know yet, but, um, right. but again, we may want to 
income would increment instead of going to the maximum amount allowable under the mm -hmm. statute at least i mean this hasn't been changed in the 30 years i've been sitting here so. i did twenty thousand. i can tell you back in the early 80s that's what the chap uh Chapter 59, Section 541A was then. So I the town of North Reading has actually never changed. Right. So okay, so I think I just need to give um, some of the other members the opportunity to ask questions and participate in this discussion yeah. at this point. Um, and Mr. Walner. Yeah, no, I mean, just Have obviously. You but you know, if the average property tax um, in North Reading is like eight to nine thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars is ridiculous. I mean, at a minimum, it have to be forty thousand dollars. So at least it's like twenty five percent of their income. So I mean, if we even want to have this program, um, it has to at least be forty thousand, if not sixty thousand. And it would be interesting if you could find out, Deb, what other towns have set theirs at and how much utilization there is, if you have that kind of access, because that would help us to gauge you know where that number should be um but i think it's a good idea and i think also eight percent is really greedy i mean again back in the 80s that was a conservative number for this right, exactly right. <laughs> you know that time i think it was like you know 12 percent or something maybe even higher um so that seems a little greedy to me so um I, those are the two most obvious things are just nobody qualifies because nobody can live here at twenty thousand. so um pretty pretty straight ahead to me so I can tell you Andover is has increased theirs to 40,000 also reduced the interest from the 8% down to 5% and Reading followed suit. So Reading is the same 40,000 and reduced their interest down to 5. So it'd be interesting if you just find out if anybody's gone for it. You know, is anybody using it at 40,000? Because it's not good to have a program if nobody uses it, right? So um, if you can find that out, that'd be helpful for us. Okay. I can. I think that's, in, that's important in terms of our decision, too, to know what kind of an impact that's going to have on our right. uh, you know, local, local receipts. Yep. Mr. Walner, are you all set? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. It's a good idea. Okay, Mr. Mr. Schultz? A couple of thoughts. We've just spent 20, 30 minutes discussing a a project or a plan that no one has used in 10 years and that we have no idea how much it's going to cost the town. I think before we have any further discussion is we need to know what is this going to cost as far as receipts. The other question is from a title standpoint, what if we have a senior who is a reverse mortgage or has their equity maxed out in their house, they're going to take this because they know they're not going to have to pay it. And then you're going to have a house that's underwater when it eventually gets foreclosed on and you're going to have vacant property. So I think we have to be careful how high we make that income level. We truly want to help those in need, but we're setting something up that could be used as a tool to just avoid taxes. And I don't know if that's, that's not the intention, but unless we're doing title exams on these properties and finding out whether there's equity or not, you know, we're putting ourselves in a lean position that we're going to end up being paid potentially at a foreclosure sale when a house that's vacant for two years. Do we really want that as a town? I don't know. And I, I just think we got to find out any of this stuff right now, given the budget constraints that we have that have been thrown on us because of COVID-19, before we decide to do anything, we need to know what does it cost. Until we know that, I don't see how we can even discuss this. So to answer the part of a reverse mortgage, that is one of the questions on the application. They do We do have to know of the reverse mortgage. And also to let you know, if they do have a mortgage or a reverse mortgage, the bank requires them the bank will also have to sign this lien we're first in order of receipt but the bank will also have to sign off on this so there are some protections um you know with the guidelines and the way they're written for mortgages and or reverse mortgages okay Mrs. Gonzalez? So, yeah, I, I mean, my heart and my feelings a thousand percent want to be able to help um, the people who are struggling, our, our seniors. Um, Mr. Schultz brings up some good points, but I'm glad to hear that there are protections against that. So, you know, that's good to know. Um, I, 
I would be for um, following suit with Andover and Reading and, you know, 60,000, I think is high, um, but 40 seems reasonable and lowering that interest rate. Um, I also had a question about um, when they come to get the paperwork, is there any assistance for them in filling that out? Does anybody Absolutely. help with that? Yes, we help them. We help all of our seniors. Um, a lot of times I'll take them in my office. I mean, today might be a little different, but yeah. um, we'd figure something out. Um, I take them in the office and we help them fill it out. Absolutely. That's good to hear. All um, the time. It's unfortunate going, you know, it, at this point, I mean, normally I would be like, oh my gosh, of course we're going to do this. But, you know, I have my reservations with, you know, the whole COVID thing going on and, and we're, we're already going to be financially in trouble. And um, it sounds like there wouldn't be a lot of people doing this, but um, I understand Mr. Schultz's reservations. It's a tough time. I mean, we just, we just had some tough discussions. Um, but I think it's something we, we definitely need to explore and think about and, and make a decision on. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. And from the chair, I also, I would agree with uh, Mr. Schultz and Mrs. Gonzalez that we, we actually already have the program in place. Um, it is already available for someone who de determines the need, the financial need to defer the payment and pay the high interest attached to it. Um, so we already have that available for someone at the 20,000 whose taxes are 9,000. Um, they could come in and apply for that. And also I know that as we heard, there are a number of other exemptions uh, that, that individuals can avail themselves of. It's hardship exemption, elderly exemption. There's also, uh, you know, our assessor works with individuals and, and works on what available exemptions there are. So I definitely wouldn't, um, I definitely wouldn't be in favor of it unless it's fully vetted. And I, I, I don't think we have it on the agenda to add it as a warrant article. I, I think we need a lot more information before we do that. Um, so if we have Madam Chair. No, oh, Mr. O'Leary. Oh, and Mr. Waller's got his hand up too. Yeah. Uh, first of all, as far, as, as far as having a program in place, we have a program in place that nobody takes advantage of because it doesn't work. It doesn't work. $20,000 doesn't work. 8% uh, interest rate doesn't work. And people are not availing themselves of the opportunity. We have nobody that's participated since 2009. Um, so that means the program we have in place isn't what it's designed to do and isn't isn't working you know in relation to you know well the, the age of the the COVID-19 here and that we're worried about some revenue here I mean these are the very people that we should be reaching out and trying to help and assist to stay in the community and you know I don't believe there's going to be a significant amount and I think Mr. Walner's suggestion to find out you know how many people in Andover and Reading are actually participating at the forty thousand dollar level is also going to be eye-opening. I don't know how many, I don't expect there's going to be an awful lot of people uh, that are still participating. So that $40,000 level may not be one that works for people, but I think we need to find that out. But I think we should, rather than uh, kicking this down the road and we have an opportunity to help some people, if we so decide to do so, you know, for the current fiscal year coming up, we should avail ourselves of that opportunity. So I think we should put a warrant article on, and again, we can always pass it over, if the, the numbers don't pan out or it doesn't seem to work for us or we think the projections are gonna to be too much of an adverse impact. But I think we have the time to put a warrant article on, do a little research and get the facts and, and take some action. And that, but that action may very well be passing over at a June town meeting. But I think we should put it on the warrant, avail ourselves of that, uh, that opportunity and help those seniors uh, that need the help the most. So, I see no reason to defer defer the action on the deferrals, you know, um, till October or okay. the following Thank you, June. Mr. O'Leary. I think we need to move on now. We've talked about this quite a bit. I don't think we have a consensus to put anything on the warrant. Mr. Walner has his hand up, but I do think we need to 
to move on now. It's on, we, I think it was put on the agenda to make people aware of the program, and I, certainly people are aware of the program. Um, if they weren't already aware of it, although we've heard some people have applied and then did, you know, not avail themselves of it because there's other exemptions available, but we do need to move on. Mr. Walney, you had your hand up too? Just from a fiscal point of view, if you have someone who's older who lives in a home, they probably don't have children at home. If they decide to move out, the, the new residents will probably have children. And as we know, children in our school systems are very expensive. So from a fiscal point of view only, um, keeping the seniors in their homes is, is better fiscally for the town than to um, have them replaced prematurely or unnecessarily. It's just, it's just simple math. And so, you know, from a fiscal point of view, keeping them in town is very, very important. They're not a drain on the tax system. That's it. Thank you. We can talk about this more later. Could, could we just uh, get a, a, a true consensus so we as to whether- We get a little bit more information on uh, how this would impact the receipts and what your um, projections are in terms of how many individuals might be eligible for it and those types of things. Um, and Mr. Gilbert, did you have your hand up or? I, I do see a hand raised. Mr. Studo uh, has his hand up, Madam Chair, through you. Oh, okay. All right. So, Mr. Studo. Hi. Uh, just, uh, just a couple questions for Deborah. Um, and well, first, I can shed some light too on uh, one thing she pointed out that um, if banks do have to give an okay, Unfortunately, because of a lot of the restrictions that the larger banks have put into place the last 30 days, I can tell you right now, no matter where the limit is, it's going to be very difficult to get a bank to agree to this. Um, I mean, people with the best stats possible are not able to even get a loan. So just, just a little side note that no matter what the town does, if they have a mortgage already, you're they're going to they're going to have a very uphill battle to get a sign off from a bank right now. Um, but my question is, um, if maybe do we have a, is the town privy to what people make, meaning not all of it, but like tax return information, just to get an idea of how many people would even qualify um, before we even start without even asking and over whoever, like if we said it goes to 50, thousand or 40 would we have an idea of how many people theoretically could apply if they wanted to I, i'm trying to wrap my head around how i would project the potential number of participants in the town and i'll be honest with you i do not have a clear definitive answer on how i would get that number yet um will i think of something i you know it was just brought up maybe 10 minutes ago so okay. i yeah that's I, fine I, that, that, that just the general and then one last question because i'm not familiar with the program is besides income um and your home are any other assets taken into account meaning that when i apply Maybe I have a home that my taxes are high and I'm only showing 40,000 of income. Just to, I'm just using that example because it's been brought up. But is there any other question like a lot of the other state bound programs yes. where yes. if you have 50,000 of income, but then you have a $700,000 401k, you're yes. not gonna qualify for the program no matter what you show for income. Is yes, that it, it's income asset driven. All okay, right. so asset driven as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Mr. Sudo. And so it actually was on the agenda for you to review the exemptions and the deferral program. So why, why don't we close with you reviewing what exemptions are available for our taxpayers? Madam, Madam Chair, I'd just like to answer the question in relation to uh, the Department of Revenue can provide uh, information as to how many, which would give you the outside number, can provide how many people in the town of North Reading qualified applied and qualified for the circuit breaker. So that would give you an outside number. Oh, okay. So uh, maybe uh, Representative, Jones, Representative Jones' okay. office could probably help facilitate uh, getting that information for you. 
That's great. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. So why don't you review the exemptions because that was what it is actually on the agenda as well, including the deferral program, but also the exemptions that are available for our taxpayers. Okay. And then the, the, the deadline date for them to, to um, apply for those. So the deadline date to, traditionally would have been April 1st. But because of the pandemic, um, the Department of Revenue did push all of our exemptions out to June 1st. With that being said, we, the town has adopted many of the exemptions that are um, available through the state. We have a surviving spouse that would be, you'd have to qualify, you'd have to be over 70. Um, that is an income asset driven. We have a legally blind exemption. If you have a certificate from Boston stating that you are considered to be legally blind, that's $500 off of your tax bill. Uh, we have a 41D, which is an age. You must be 65 and the income for single cannot be more than $21,476. Uh, $21,476 if single, $24,810 if married. And these, these numbers that I'm giving you for income from these exemptions are handed down from Boston. I don't, I can't create them. They hand them down to us. They do adjust them manually by the CPI. Uh, the assets cannot exceed 46,105 if single. And if married, it's 49,398 if married. Uh, we have, and then we have the 41A, which is the deferral. And then all of our veterans exemptions. Are, I'm not gonna go over those because those are pretty self-explanatory. And again, a letter must come from Boston, tell us the veterans percent. And that's how we, you know, prorate their tax bill. So these, the exemptions are in place. When a taxpayer comes to our office, we do go over all of these to see which one they may qualify for. Because even if they're in there inquiring about the deferral, they, if they qualify for one of the other exemptions, that would come off the top before their deferred taxes come off. So we would always help them in that way. Um, so that being said, that's what we have. We do, you know, if any of the taxpayers want us to mail them a cheat sheet, I can put it up on the website. Uh, there's, there's many ways. We do mail some out. Um, most of the time they come in and we sit down and we talk about them, you know, and, and that seems to be traditionally what they prefer. For their okay, but they can find this on the website in your department. Yes, all of this and then the application is on the website. They can apply online. And the applications are there also. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. So I think we're wanting you to to give us some projections on this and giving you some, you know, ability to kind of sort that out for us and come back to us with a little bit more information on it, okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, have Thank a good you. night. You too, Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. All right, our next order of business is the special town meeting and Seven Acres Poultry Farm update. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. As a, a quick update, um, the. Uh, town's uh, due diligence relative to the property uh, does continue um, with some uh, review that is taking place over at the property beginning this week. We are hoping to have a report relative to um, the findings 
of the final reports relative to the findings uh, later in the month of, um, of June for review. Uh, I will just make everyone aware that you know the timing will be tight with regard to the town meeting, but we do have um, a plan to get that information back before the evening of the town meeting, although it may not be until the week immediately prior to the June uh, 29th town meeting. But that work is underway. Uh, and that leads us into the next agenda item, which is uh, to seek ratification of your approval, Madam Chair, for the right of entry for that work to occur, um, which I believe you may have signed that document via email last week, and we're just asking for the board to ratify your signature. Uh, after the I was going to say, I signed that already. If you didn't sign actually, it, I think, <laughs> I think, yeah, I think I signed that today, actually. So. Okay, great. Okay. A little early signing it without the vote, so hang on to it till we well, vote. We, we have to the we the have to vote. Here, so I appreciate the board's we vote. <laughs> yeah, we got a motion for that. Madam Chair, I move to ratify the authorization of the chair to sign the second right of entry dated May 12, 2020, for 412 14 Concord Street. Second. I have a motion by Mrs. Gonzalez and a second by Ms. Dershel. Any discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Schultz. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And I vote aye. Unanimous. Okay, so it's signed. <laughs> so you can move ahead with that one. All right, next order of business is we are next order of business is approve the order of taking for a temporary water rechlorination facility at 327 main street boston flower market vote to approve and authorize the chair to sign madam chair through you we put that on the agenda just because uh, we were coming down to the wire last week with getting a final sign off on the waiver from the owner of the property as you know we did get that uh, waiver signed uh, back and Appreciate your flexibility of making yourself available to sign that document on Friday, which allowed us to record that taking uh, with the Registry of Deeds on Friday. Um, so this vote uh, is not required at this point. And um, I can tell you that the Water Department and our, con our construction contractor were over at the location today, um, beginning preparation, um, our, uh, the trailer mounted. Um, so that work is, is moving forward. Perfect. All right, so that means we can move on to the next order of business, and that is to approve the order of taking for a water rechlorination facility, 303 Main Street, vote to approve and authorize the chair to sign, Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, through you, we did put this on the agenda as we are working with that property owner um, relative to the waiver. There was a question that came up on Friday relative to the waiver and whether we could put a specific location and some specific detail on a plan associated with it. So that's something that the Department of Public Works is, um, is doing. I can tell you though, that with the license that we entered into with the property owner a couple of weeks ago, um, we've begun work at that site as well. If you drive by, you'll see that there is a front end loader and some, um, some water main pipe that has been stored at the site. So that work is, is proceeding forward. And um, the timing with regard to this order of taking is not going to delay that work from occurring. So I, we expect we'll be back with the request for final action on that on uh, June 1st when that waiver's in hand. Okay. Uh, you. We, we would be suggesting a vote conditional upon receipt of the waiver, except that I don't want to run into the same issue we ran into last night where the statutory timeline ran out on us. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. All right. So we we don't we're we're not going to vote on it this evening. You don't need to take action this evening. That's correct. Okay. Okay. All right. So our next order of business is to review and discuss the June town meeting warrant. Thank you, Madam Chair. We do have an updated version of the warrant before you. Um, I would just point out that the. The changes that are on there are the addition of the warrant article relative to um, the uh, 20 Elm Street site, um, a warrant article for funding for litigation 
for that purpose. Um, we are holding an amount that I'm not going to um, go through um, publicly at this point in time, but expect to have the ability to finalize it at the June 1st meeting, but we are holding an amount of uh, funding for that. Um, and I've asked town council to give us the, uh, their projection and I'm awaiting that final number back, but I, I expect that we have sufficient funding available for that article um, for the request of the ward. Um, in terms of the warrant development, uh, with all of the other things going on, we've not had the opportunity to finalize a language for Article 25, but we will make sure to get that done before the June 1st date. Whether or not we'll have the ability to capitalize that account, I, I think is a significant question given the overall financial picture that we're at, although um, we are certainly hopeful, but um, know that we're, we're, we're going through some challenges. And then you see we have the language relative to Article 26, relative to the um, uh, effective military services on salary, seniority, and leave allowances for our employees. And this would be an article to formalize a program that has been in place here in town for a number of years, um, but just has not been statutorily accepted by town meeting. And I'd be happy to answer. So just, just for edification of those joining us remotely, Article 25 that Mr. Gilberto just referred to has to do with establishing a fund uh, or an account a fund for historical buildings in the town and article 26 has to do with the, the town's acceptance of uh, military uh, military services military leave services statute chapter 33 section 59 right mr gilberto correct. thank you madam chair for that explanation that's correct okay and then we've got um in addition so those are the newer articles we have we actually have uh, 33 articles Correct. on the warrant, to a long warrant. So those are the mo more recently added articles. Right, so only one article has been added. That, that was Article 24 relative to 20 Elm Street. Article 25 has been on the list and on the draft all along. We just have not finalized the language for it. Uh, although the purpose, I think, as you can see, is probably as it reads, which is funding for historic buildings. And then Article 26 was one that uh, we finalized the language for over the past week and we'll be giving to town council. To review. Gotcha. I think we're there in terms of the warrant, um, notwithstanding any items that the board may wish to add either you know, this evening or in a future you know, on the June 1st meeting, but we think we're pretty close there. Seems like it'll be a long meeting. All right, and then let's have any questions about what we've added so far. Mrs. Gonzalez has her hand up. Mrs. <coughs> God bless you. I, I would like to propose adding one more article to the warrant. Um, and I, I wrote a little something to clarify it. Um, in light of the pandemic and the decision to temporarily ban cloth reusable bags at all the stores and businesses, I feel a need to revisit the plastic bag ban that was voted in at town meeting. If my colleagues recall my comments at that town meeting, I spoke about the fact that not everyone is diligent about cleaning their bags, which leads to germs and bacteria being transported from homes to stores, and more importantly, to the supermarket workers who are predominantly either teenagers or senior citizens. I feel it is our duty as a board to add the overturning of the plastic bag ban to the warrant and allow the voters of North Reading to decide if they would like to be able to choose to use plastic again. This does not mean that I'm asking to ban the cloth bags. Um, as you all know, I'm not a supporter of bans of any kind. We should all be free to make choices. Education on disposal of and recycling of plastic bags is my goal. Let's not expose our vulnerable citizens to bacteria and disease. I think that if you wanna bring your cloth bag in, that should be your choice, but you should have to go to the register that you bag your own groceries. That's all. So, Mrs. Gonzalez, you're asking yeah. for us to put a warrant article yeah. on um, for a repeal of our bylaw banning the use of plastic bags. Correct. <laughs> Basically. Okay. And those are my reasons. Okay. So, let's um talk to those members about this uh, we need some input on on this mr o'leary 
comments, questions? Uh, no, I advocated for uh, the plastic bags moratorium. Uh, so no, I'm not in favor of revisiting it. I'm not in favor of it in light of COVID or any other reason. I think environmentally, it makes sense what, what was done. And um, you know, if there was a temporary need as there appears to have been um, to do so, that's fine. But no, I don't think we need to revisit it. If we're gonna put a warrant article on for this, we should put a warrant article on also for the uh, deferral of taxes too. So okay. no, thank you. And drones. All right, Mr. Walner. Um, it, for some reason, I thought, didn't Massachusetts already build in a statewide plastic bag ban? I mean, I'm just looking at my, my phone real quick here, but I think Massachusetts has already trumped us up. And like more than 100, like more than half the communities in Massachusetts have already done it. So I'm, I'm not looking to revisit or overrule <laughs> Massachusetts if we've already, it's already been decided on the state level. So yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing it. I don't know the answer to your question. Do you, Mr. Gilberto? I know there's been quite a bit of discussion at the legislative level, but I, I don't believe that it actually got over the finish line. Although I remember hearing as recently as January or February that it was very close. I just, I'm not certain that it actually got signed into law, but it may have been. Okay. So Mr. Wally, you're not in favor of putting an article to repeal on. Uh, yeah, I'm just reading real quick. No, I'm not, because the Massachusetts Senate voted in favor of a statewide ban on plastic bags in its last formal session of the year on Wednesday. This was just the end of 2019. So, I mean, I think it's just imminent. I think we'd be, you know, even if we got approved, even if we got a reverse, it would just get reversed again. I think this is confusion at this point. So I'm not in favor of it. Okay. Mr. Schultz. Yeah, the state has not the state actually has put out a thing allowing or repealing the plastic bag ban because of COVID-19. And while our, I didn't support the, the prohibition when it was on a year or two ago, I certainly don't support it now. I mean, we're in a different environment here. We want to talk about protecting those. We want to give more than lip service of protecting those who are most vulnerable. How about our people at Stop and Shop that work the checkout lines? We're going to have them handling cloth bags, which are, frankly, they're a Petri dish on their cleanest day. Now with COVID-19, you don't know where they've been. I, we need to protect our, these store workers. I, I don't think this is even arguable that plastic bags are more sanitary at this point. And I think the voters should be a lot of chance to decide. I mean, why wouldn't we allow the voters to take a look at this? If they vote no, then the ban stays. But why are we afraid as a board to put this to the voters? I, that, that's beyond me. Thank I think you. if we are truly worried about people's safety, we should do things that keep people safe. I, yeah, I, I don't think anyone. I don't think anyone said they're afraid to 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 do to put it to the voters. So I don't know where you got that, but, um, yeah, but two I think it's just the matter of it. Was, I think it was a matter that it was a, a a long deliberated effort that already was put to the voters at the town meeting, and the bylaw was approved. So but things have I don't changed. Think it, okay, the world's changed since then. We need to acknowledge the world has changed. And why we don't put it to the voters? Listen, my colleagues don't have to vote for it, but it should at least go to the voters. It should at least go to the voters. Thank you. I just, can I just jump in here for a quick second. The health department. <laughs> has already, <laughs> Thank you for raising your hand, Mr. Waller. Yes, go ahead. The health department has already, during the pandemic, has already said, "Don't bring those in." During Correct. The pandemic. I assume the pandemic is not going to exist for the rest of our lives. I assume at some point there'll be a vaccine and this won't exist. So the health department did the right thing saying, okay, we're in a pandemic, we don't need to share germs, so let's go back to single-use plastic during this time, but when it's done, we should go back to normal life. I, I, don't, I don't see that as being um, inconsistent with safety practices at all. Rich, but, read the reopening plan by the governor. This is not going away. This is gonna be here for years. We need to protect the most vulnerable, and those are our strong. I'm not, I'm not doing okay. it. Folks, let's let's. I'm a, I I love the healthy debate about it, but please let's not talk over each other. It's already difficult enough for Jane to take notes of our meetings as it is, even though we're being recorded. Let's one at a time discuss this, Mr. O'Leary. Just want to comment. I think I was down at it was a stop and shop or market basket in Reading. They gave me paper bags. They gave me paper bags, not plastic, paper. 
No, newspaper. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> From off the committee, and I, I myself would only be in favor of it, of it if we're sponsoring Mr. O'Leary's <laughs> article to go on there as well, because I agree it's only fair. Let the voters decide that issue as well. Um, Mr. Mr. Scudo, I think, had his hand up. Uh, just, <laughs> just to piggyback on Mr. O'Leary's comment, um, today I was at North Reading Stop and Shop and they gave me paper and I specifically asked, oh, I thought you could use plastic right now. And I don't know if this is true or not, but multiple employees told me that North Reading told them to stop using plastic. So at the state level, though, the governor, you know, I'm just saying the facts are the governor is still allowing plastic. So uh -oh. Um, I don't know if North Red, I mean, again, if, if at the, like Mr. Warner said, the state can trump, but if the state is saying to allow plastic right now, did North Reading have the right to tell the stop and shop to stop using it? I'm just curious. I don't know. I was, I was in Reading. I wasn't in the North Reading store. No, no, no. I mean, but I mean, just to say like, I does when it's the other way around, can North Reading make it more restrictive than the state? It can't make it looser, but can it make it more restrictive? Meaning, is it true that if anybody on this board knows that North Reading told North Reading Stop and Shop they cannot use plastic? Because that's what I was told today. Yeah, I got plastic there over the weekend, Vincenzo, so I don't think that's the case. Um, it was over it was the weekend. Morning, but, so. Yeah. Okay. I'm, all right. So let's, uh, I think we need to move on, on the, to this topic. But uh, Mr. Gilbert, did you have anything to add to that or? I don't know if we even have an answer to that question. You're muted as well. Thank you. I had a bit of a technical difficulty with my computer here, so now I'm on my cell phone. Um, so we had a we had a prohibition that was approved at town meeting in October, excuse me, June of last year. Went into effect in January. We did a kind of a stay in the enforcement to March, and then the governor came out with a a superseding order that basically um, suspended any prohibition such as ours. And I am not aware of any attempt to interfere with that since that occurred. Um, I can tell you that my family did go, when my wife went to the supermarket on Sunday, she came home with paper bags from the stop and shop in North Reading. Um, so uh, I know they were, they were using paper, um, but as to them being told not to use paper, not to use plastic, I'm not sure that, I'm not aware that that happened, but I certainly will follow up. Okay, thank you. Um, I, Mrs. Gonzalez. I just want to, you know, reiterate that we're, we're either concerned about the seniors or we're not. I mean, you, you, you pick and choose. I mean, this is absolutely affecting them. This is who we have working at the supermarkets. And there, I do not believe that they should have to touch people's dirty, filthy bacteria bags. And that's not to say that everybody's is like that, but there are people who do not clean their bags. And this pandemic has shined the light on the fact that those bags are not sanitary. And for me, I feel that they should not be exposed to that. So I just want to, kind of drive that point home. Okay. I do not think you have a consensus to put it on the warrant article, but however, this strikes me as very similar to the snow and ice sidewalk, snow and ice removal debate that carried on and ended up being the result of a petition being put on there. Um, I don't know that we've heard a, a lot based on the rollout in January and the moratorium that was put in effect, um, which is probably going to be similar to, you know, restaurants having to use plastic wear for a temporary time being until we get through COVID-19, things like that, where it's temporarily permitted or temporarily acceptable. But what I'm saying is I don't think we've heard, and I think that our establishments went, you know, a long way to converting over to comply with the bylaw, um, with the with ship, shipped into paper products. So I think that would be putting a lot upon them to have to go back or convert back when they've already 
you know, come miles and miles to comply with it as it is. But, um, but again, it could be like snow and ice where it gets put on through, uh, you know, citizen petition. Oh, Mr. Schultz has his hand up. Mr. Uh, Schultz. On that point, and Michael, this is probably more for you. I, I got, did have a citizen reach out to me asking if they could do a citizen's petition for this very issue. I wasn't sure though what, where we have town meeting delayed. Do they still have time to do a citizen's petition? And when will they have to do it by to get it on this town meeting's warrant? So that the warrant articles for a citizen's petition were due the third Monday in March. Um, you know, whether or not the board is willing to put an article on um, despite that deadline not being you know, reached is, you know, I, I think a decision for the board and something that we could talk about with town council. But the standing answer on things like this has been up until the point in time the warrant is signed, the board has the ability by a majority vote to put an article on. But uh, a petitioner would not have a right to put a, a warrant article on this warrant at this point, in my opinion. Even with the delays because of the... I, I don't believe so. I believe that the deadline is still, from a statutory standpoint, having already passed, I, I don't I don't know that they would have a right to do so, especially where we're now only two weeks out. I mean, it'd be one thing if we were talking about six weeks out, but we're two weeks from the warrant being signed. So again, that's my personal opinion. It's not a legal opinion, but would the would the board have any objection to a citizen putting a petition on? Oh, uh, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we can answer that, but I mean, October is pretty. It's also October. October time. I just don't think we've heard issue. from uh, heard enough of an issue with regard to this to to consider repealing the bylaw. Though I understand the debate, I understand the point um, that you're making, uh, in a, but I don't think you have a consensus to put it on the warrant article. No, but no, if I'm you not did saying have that, a would, would, if, if you did have a consensus, I would say put Mr. O'Leary's on there too, and then we have to decide that now. So, but, but if, I, if I think citizen was to make a petition in the next week, would we as a board deny that? Should be able to well, answer that question. It's not now. enough time. Uh, I don't think it's enough time. Not even up to us. <laughs> No, it is rich because we're past the deadline. We would have to accept the citizen's petition. Right. Yeah, haven't signed the warrant yet. I think we have to be careful of, of the form. I, I really think going down the road of the citizen's petition, I, the town clerk has to certify the signatures when they come in. And I believe that we're, we're well past that, that deadline. I think if the board is willing to entertain a, something like that, then you know a more prudent approach would probably be for the board itself to put the article on. Right. But I think going down that path, I think we're going we're, we're gonna to open up problems and, and I actually know that the town clerk is on she was on the call if she has something that she wishes to add <laughs> I'd encourage her to raise her hand but um, I, I think that we'll be on that that deadline at this point for, for June at least and I think there's a there's a protocol in place for a reason so there is a hand okay. raised um, I know I can see that it's saying Ree's phone mm -hmm. yes do you see that Mr. Gilberto? I do. yes Yes. The person I, you can unmute it for the individual to state your name and your address, please, so that we know who you are participating. This is town clerk Barbara Stats. I oh. lost my connection with my iPad, so I'm on my phone. Oh, so now we oh, know yeah. your nickname. <laughs> now you know I am affectionately known as Barbara Lee, my grandchildren. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, as, as Mr. Gilberto said, the time frame has gone by under our bylaws for a citizen's petition. I actually had somebody who asked about that after the deadline. The legislation didn't change deadlines such as that. Other, The other requirements for town meeting um, uh, requirements, you know, stayed uh, intact. The date of uh, the citizen's petitions is 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 set, so we can't accept a citizen's petition at this time. If the board wishes to put an article on, that's a different matter, but not not by a citizen's petition. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. But there be there would be enough time for that. And Mrs. Seth, did did someone inquire to you a citizen's petition to repeal the plastic bag bylaw? That is correct. But the time okay. has passed by. Okay. And and there would be time though for October. 
October. Definitely. Family. Yeah, I advised the person that uh, it is the third Monday in August that the citizens' petitions are due for October town meeting. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, I'm losing people's. Uh, okay. So I I think we we just move on. And I, I don't, I think that the majority consensus is to leave it in place. There's already a moratorium in place that we have to abide by. Um, some of the establishments are using paper and some of the establishments are, and the establishments in North Reading are using paper. Some of them are using plastics. I know in Lawrence Market Basket and Reading Market Basket, they're using paper, uh, plastic, but in ours, they're continuing to use the paper bags. So drop and drop in the other stores. Um, I don't know if there's any further discussion of the membership. Are we? No. Okay, all set? I guess so. Okay. So the board. Oh, we don't have a consensus. To, we don't have a consensus at this moment to put it on the. Uh, so the uh, on the um, is not to um, let the people decide whether they want to protect the seniors or not. That's the decision. And also, the board didn't want to decide whether or not to assist the seniors that are financially not, you know, able to pay their tax as well. But so. I thought we were going to discuss that during the warrants. So we're just waiting to see what that would cost you before we decide whether to do or not next. I week. don't think a decision was made on that. Uh, I don't think so. Heartened to hear it. That's good. So, are we going to put a if we're going to discuss both? Right. Yeah, I mean, I don't know why we're afraid to put this before the vote. I don't either. Okay. I don't think we're I don't think anyone's afraid to decide. <laughs> I don't think anyone's afraid to put anything to a vote. Um, I do. But I, I do. We can put it forward a two to three vote. You guys don't want to do it. Is it a, a more appropriate time to do it? And that's at a regular town meeting in October for someone wants to. Put it forward, or if the majority of the board again, there'll be a change in the in the board. You know, at the end of June, if the majority of the board wishes to put an article in the meeting warrant for October, they can do it. Okay, Mrs. Gonzalez, you're gonna have the this last time. say on this issue because we do have to move on. Can we take Go a ahead. vote so we know where everybody stands on this? Okay, I think I polled the membership, but I will ask again. If the member, I guess the vote would be make a motion. Make a motion then. I'll move to place, the, not to simply place on the town meeting floor a warrant article to ban the plastic bag. Conversely, I'm not saying anyone has to be for it. This is simply a motion to place it on the floor at town meeting. I'll second. Okay, so I have a motion by Mr. Schultz, which is to place it on the floor. Are you repealing the bylaw? You're asking the, to request yes. to put an article on to repeal the plastic ban bylaw. That's what you're asking. Yes, and I don't care if we put it on there with an adverse recommendation from the select board. I'm just saying it should be on the floor. Correct. Second. I have a motion and a second. Does anyone want to make an make a add amendment to that? If we put that on, we should put on Mr. O'Leary's initiative. I'm just uh, I'm, I'm I'm ready to vote. <laughs> All right, Mr. Okay, a motion by Mr. Schultz and a second by Mrs. Gonzalez. And I have Mr. O'Leary. No. Okay, Mr. Walner. No. Mr. Schultz. Yes. Mrs. Gonzalez. Yes. And I vote no. So the motion fails. Does not carry at the moment. So you guys don't right. let the voters decide. 
they decided less than a year ago. Steve, we're in a global pandemic with health issues. You don't want to let the voters decide, just own it. Right, own it. All right. I own it. Let's, I, I help sponsor let's, it. Let's not get into it. We, we, we own it. We don't do it. I advocate it. Right. So, so, folks, I'm going to call this to order. We, we did actually address this at town meeting, and the voters did already decide on this. It was a so let's move on to the next order of business. <laughs> which is, give me a second. The next order of business is to review the FY 2021 revenue and expense plan and discuss departmental reductions. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And with us this evening is the finance director, Elizabeth Rock, who has prepared an updated revenue plan, um, which was reviewed this morning at a financial planning team meeting Again, for those who are not aware, the financial planning team includes myself, the finance director, the superintendent of schools, the school business manager, representatives of the select board, the school committee, and the finance committee. Um, and we reviewed the document, which the finance director will go through with you. Um, unfortunately, over the past few weeks, our revenue projections, particularly in the area of state aid in the form of state education and unrestricted aid, um, the projections have... Uh, have decreased, and uh, this revenue plan will uh, will reflect that. Uh, at the same time, we've had some discussions about some steps that we could take to try to mitigate the impact of those those reductions, and those items are reflected on this uh, this plan as well. <clears throat> Make no mistake, this is going to be a very challenging period for us to balance both the municipal and the school budgets going into our June 29th town meeting, as you'll see from this presentation. And um, the second part of the, this evening's presentation is just to begin to review um, some of the reductions that we're required to look at in order to try to balance the budget. And those, budget, those, those steps won't even balance the budget at this point. They'll only get us closer to being balanced. So with that, I'm gonna ask the finance director, if she's there, if she would uh, go through the, uh, the update um, for the board and for the public. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm gonna share my screen, but I also did put the PowerPoint presentation um, in share file in today's meeting packet, as well as the updated revenue plan in today's meeting packet. I did not put it into the budget folder. I just put it into today's meeting packet. <coughs> Can everybody see my screen? Yep. Okay. So um, as the town administrator mentioned, we have had significant changes to revenue within um, the revenue plan. Uh, significantly, the changes have been to state aid. So um, significant changes to state aid. We've cut state aid in two categories by 10%. We cut chapter 70 by 10% and cut unrestricted general government aid by 10% based upon FY20's um, budget number. They totaled uh, 903,000. Uh, some of the things that we did to offset this large um, cut to the revenue plan at this late time in the, the season is um, we were able to use a one-time increase from cell tower revenue of 250,000. <coughs> that would make the cell tower transfer um, 550,000. We traditionally annually transfer 300,000 from cell tower, um, which is listed other, un, under other financing sources. We also increased the debt capital stabilization fund transfer by um, 149,000, which was um, to include short-term uh, debt interest, which is ban interest, which is what you signed this evening, and uh, the little school roof uh, debt payment, which that was um, always segregated out from our debt levels that we always kept at uh, 1.2 million. Moving on, um, we are choosing to fund school and municipal retirements with free cash for a total of $200,000. These retirements are um, 
individuals who are retiring and it's their uh, sick and vacation buybacks, um, but mainly their uh, sick buyouts according to their contractual obligation. We also have decided to fund the snow and ice deficit uh, with free cash. To date, the snow and ice deficit is approximately 220,000. That's what I have um, according to the general ledger of what we've expended. And there could be still some small outstanding bills that DPW could still have. Uh, but according to the revenue plan, we were carrying 315,000 to cover this deficit. So we have cut that 315 out of the revenue plan. So interrupt Liz, but is anybody else seeing this? I'm only, oh, wait a minute. Sorry, I stopped sharing. I'm sorry, I just wasn't seeing your, I was only seeing the main screen. Can you, okay. I can see it now, yep. Okay. Can you see it now? Yep. Now? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just recapping, um, the significant changes were made to Chapter 70 and unrestricted general government aid. They were a 10% cut based upon FY20's uh, budget numbers. They totaled 903,000. Some things that we did to offset the large uh, reduction in revenue was that we uh, felt we could do a one-time increase of 250,000 from cell tower revenue, which would bring the cell tower revenue transfer to 550,000. We uh, traditionally annually transfer 300,000 from cell tower. We also increased the transfer from debt capital stabilization fund to include short-term um, interest and the little school roof debt payment totaling 149,000. We also were able to pull out school and municipal retirements, which are uh, contractual obligations according to, you know, sick buyouts um, or vacation buyouts with free cash uh, totaling 200,000. Um, 120 on the school side and um, actually 140 on the school side and 60 on the municipal side. And we are able to fund the snow and ice deficit with free cash, which would pull out 315,000 from the revenue plan. And according to my records, um, which are actual expenditures paid out to date, the deficit is 220,000. DPW could have some small bills that still remain to be paid or have not been received yet. Um, so that is, you know, approximately the, the deficit amount. Um, so Liz? Yes. Through you, Madam Chair, could you just kind of summarize? We had the, were the reductions compared to the the mitigation that the the total impact. Sure. So the um, if I go to the first slide, um, the the total reduction from this revenue plan was nine hundred and three thousand. Um, the total additions uh, to the revenue plan was 914. So we have a difference of approximately 10,000 um, greater than the reductions. You take the 250, the 150, the 200, and the 315. They total 914, mm -hmm. and the total reduction is 903. So I, you know, I want to um, I want to recognize the work of the finance director to try to identify things that we could do that were um, incremental um, and that would not jeopardize our our overall um, financial well-being um, while mitigating the impact of the the cuts that we're we're going to see or we're we're expecting this to see from the state. The state's numbers are are very much in flux. Um, and the state's situation is going to uh, also be dependent upon any federal money that we do or do not see um, from the various relief packages that are out there um, at, uh, at the federal government's level, including one that was discussed in the House of Representatives last week. Uh, we did submit a letter on behalf of the board signed by the chair um, last week for consideration by our congressional delegation. And I think that we're hopeful has, as has been the case when we've seen economic downturn in the past, most recently in 2009, that there will be relief 
but uh, right now, um, you know, that relief does, it, 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 it's not here and the form that it would take is certainly not clear to us right now. So from a standpoint of the revenue plan, you know, we were trying two weeks ago, maybe a little more than that to sort of put the, put our, our flag in the ground as to what the numbers would be. And um, that was um, altered significantly. Um, we have been able to offset that um, with the steps that are taken here, but we still are facing a significant challenge um, for the municipal government budget heading into this uh, upcoming town meeting. And uh, Liz, okay, if I go through this slide. The next one? Yes. Yes, sure. So what you see on this slide here is uh, some actions that the finance director and I have identified um, as potential means to try to bridge the gap um, for the municipal budget. So you see at the top, um, she's articulated the, uh, the, the, the budget gap. And then also we had to add $50,000 in what has traditionally been a capital item, but now is being moved to the operating budget, which increases our gap to $1,177,040. And then you'll see a, a, a list of actions that are, um, you know, the, uh, I guess the initial secondary and tertiary review listing which we've been compiling over the past weeks um, of, of things that we could do to, to work towards balancing the budget then they include um, all of the new positions that are, were reviewed during the budget hearings in February and March as well as some new positions that were added in the fiscal year 2020 budget that uh, we had not yet had the opportunity to fill um, including the grant writing position and the part-time veteran services position, um, a number of um, needed um, small capital items that we'll look to defer. Uh, and again, I, you know, I wanna recognize the work of the finance director and um, her effort to try to find where we may be able to identify alternative funding sources for some of those items um, moving forward. Um, as we move down towards um, the bottom of that list, uh, you see um, the the current treasury position. So that's a vacancy that's being created by virtue of a transfer from treasury to the police department. Um, and um, that's a position that has been filled for a number of years that we are proposing to, to leave vacant. Um, it won't be without impact, um, but uh, we're trying to, to do things to preserve services and to try to preserve, um, preserve jobs as well. And um, we had taken some steps to add hours for the um, elder services outreach coordinator. Um, we did that a couple of years ago when we were looking to further do that here. Um, but uh, you know, at this point, we just don't have the, the funding in place to do so. So those reductions all total $897,317. And they leave us at this stage with the, approximately a $280,000 gap. And um, you know, certainly the finance director can share her opinion, but yeah, that is going to be a difficult gap to bridge for us. Uh, and we're, we're committed to finding ways to make that happen. But um, we, I don't believe that we have $280,000 of, of expense that we can easily shed either in expenses or in salary without feeling um, some significant pain. Um, so I, I say that to, to forewarn people, and that includes having to look at um, reduction in hours or elimination of uh, funding for positions. Um, it's difficult to say that, and I don't say that lightly, but that is the situation that we find ourselves in at this point. And Madam Chair, if you don't mind, I, I'm just going to add it, ask the finance director if there's anything further she would like to add. Um, certainly, I would like her to do so. Liz? Yes, may I go? Oh, cool. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there's nothing further that I would like to add at this time. The town administrator and I have a difficult road ahead of us to, um, you know, call through all these departmental budgets and see what, um, you know, will not be a detrimental impact to the budget. Um, and, you know, we will continue to meet with the financial planning team, um, you know, and come up with, with solutions um, together. And I don't know if at the, this point, anybody needs to see the actual revenue plan or if we're, we're all set. 
having the high level figures. Members have any questions? Mr. O'Leary? No questions, thank you. Mr. Walner? No, no questions, thank you. Mr. Schultz? Just a, a comment. I know last meeting, I brought up the idea of potentially using the rainy day fund and there was some hesitancy, but I think once we we get these numbers down as far as we can, we have to explore using the rainy day fund to help out this year. I mean, if we're not gonna use it during a global pandemic, when are we gonna use it? And I think we have to first get the numbers down as far as we can, but I think that it needs to be on the table. And I know it wasn't on the last meeting, but given the recent cuts in revenue that we've just seen in the past week, I don't know how we can not use a little piece of it this year to help try to fund the deficit. I, I think that's what it's there for. And if you're not gonna use it now, when are you gonna use it? Probably next year. <laughs> I think, Steve, that's a good point. I think over the next two, three years, you're going to be using a little piece of it. I don't know how you can not use it this year and next year, the year after. I think, I think we take a measured approach this year, as much as we can here, and then plan on having a need for it for next year. I think it needs to be on the table this year, though, too. I mean, we'll get it down as far as we can, but there's it's going to be some pain making this budget balance. And it, it's, you know, again, this is what it's there for. And hopefully we'll have some federal bailout like we've had in past bad economic times at some point we can't count on that but hopefully we'll have something but i think the next two three years that's got to be on the table to make this budget work Gonzalez, any comment you're on mute sorry there was noise going on in here um, I, I would have to agree with that, that we, we should probably consider at least something from there to help us out. Madam Chair. Ms. Galberto. Thank you. Um, and I you know, certainly don't want to, um, to overstep my bounds, but you know, there is also a, uh, a deficit that's being addressed within the school department as well. And I know they've been working in workshop or otherwise, you know, or other forums <clears throat> to try to address that. Liz, um, you know, I know we kind of talked around numbers this morning, but what does their deficit end up at um, based upon the, the information that we have available? So Mike, prior to, I, I had to leave the meeting early, but prior to us, um, eliminating the the snow and ice amount i i thought um they said it was two hundred and eighty thousand, um and we hadn't run the numbers as of you know when i was signing mm -hmm. off um, sure. with the snow and ice so you know if you take um their percentage of allocation which is 67.26 percent of the 315 um but i'd have to confirm with with the school sure. um assistant superintendent of finance and operations sure and I, I don't bring that up you know if anyone from the school committee is watching we've misstated the numbers we're not doing so intentionally but i, I do want the community to be aware that you know that there that we are all working within a challenging situation obviously and um you know i, I know the school committee was meeting this evening i'm sure that their meeting may be over by by this point and that they were looking to try to vote on their budget, I believe, on, on June 1st. And our hope is that we'll be able to do the same for the, the budget for the rest of the municipal departments. Um, but that will be a challenge. Thank you. Any, any other questions from the members? Um, I have a question, Mr. Gilberto. Is this, um, I know that you went back and you, you reviewed this with, our finance director based on some projected reductions in revenue from the state and you also did that based on productions in your projections on reductions in revenue for the town as well mm -hmm. did you factor that in sure so How? so the, the plan that you see um with the revision and, and we've had so many meetings that it's hard for me to keep the order straight but mm -hmm. um we had already gone through and made reductions in our assumptions for our local receipts 
um, in previous iterations of the revenue plan, for example, in meals tax, in um, excise tax, uh, licenses and permits. Um, we had made some adjustments, you know, downward already. Um, you know, what's happened over the past couple of weeks is we got, you know, the first of sort of official information out of the state house that, you know, identified what a lot of the third parties have been talking about, namely a significant reduction in state revenues. And then I had some further conversation with um, my colleagues and then with um, with Representative Jones about some of the, uh, you know, what what's what's out there and what we're, what uh, what we should expect and you know I think that you know the feedback that I got from Representative Jones you know was that a prudent approach for the town at this point would be to go to the 10% reduction in both of those state aid accounts. Um, there are communities that are more um, taking more extreme measures and reducing that number um, by up to 20%. Um, we've not taken that step at this point in time, and I, I think that's because of the feedback that we received, but and also because um, when we looked at the trends, when these types of things have happened, it does appear that the federal government has come through to sort of stabilize things, at least in the first year. The second and third year, and Liz, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, that's when the bottom really seems to fall out. Uh, and I know we've all talked about the challenge in 21 and what could be a bigger challenge in 2022. But uh, I think, you know, personally, I, I feel that this is sort of the measured, you know, approach as dramatic as it is compared to some of the things that are going on you know globally um, out there and we've talked about the concept of the 112 budget and you know the, the challenge with that is that's still a, a further reduction of um of our budget from this number and um you know I, I think if we're not able to have a town meeting on june 29th which at this point we continue to work towards having that town meeting um, you know, then I think we'd be in a situation where we have to look at the 112 in order to, to pay our bills, but I think we're hopeful that we won't be in that situation. Um, so, thank you, Madam Chair. I hope that answered your question. Yes, definitely. My concern is more of, um, will we be seeing those further reductions that have to be revisited in this for October town meeting? I think that's my concern is, in the event we didn't you know, project enough of a reduction and calculate enough of a reduction. We'd be having to revisit this for further cuts for October, I'm assuming. So, you know, I think unfortunately anything is possible and I think that nothing is off the table, um, either favorably or unfavorably with regard to this. And you're, you're absolutely right that depending upon how things play out and the timing with which it takes the powers that be at the state and federal level to make the final decisions you know we may be put in a situation of having to act or, or react and i think in the financial planning team that you know we've discussed openly that 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 is certainly a possibility um that may may come our way um as frustrating as it is to, to say that but um this is a um you know this is an economic downturn like no other in in the way that it came on and the fact that you know, that, that it, uh, you know, it, it may have been controlled in terms of what was happening at the beginning, but what's happening on the backside is certainly, you know, uh, it may be uncontrolled. <laughs> so that's yeah. the situation we find ourselves in. Okay, thank you. Are we, is, does anyone else have any questions? This is something they're obviously gonna continue working and we're gonna revisit this at our next meeting. Uh, we're gonna have another review of this at our next meeting. I, I expect that at a minimum we'll be going over the budget and, and where it stands in its formulation. And my, my hope is that it is balanced for your approval to be included in the warrant. But um, two weeks ago, I would tell you that that was what was going to happen and it would be balanced for your consideration. You know, I think we need to be open to the possibility that we may not be at that point on June 1st and we may be talking about bringing that information to town meeting, you know, that evening, unfortunately. And I, I asked the board's indulgence with the fact that, you know, we're, we're working hard to figure out where the goalposts need to be. And in the background, we are working to get aligned with those goalposts, but um, this change is, you know, significant. I, I think we left the, the financial planning team meeting, the meeting before last, you know, trying to kind of look and see, okay, what else could be done to mitigate and, you know, basically, you know, what we ended up having to do was just shore up from additional cut. So that's where we stand today. And I just, I, I asked the board's flexibility and understanding 
in what is a, a, just a very difficult time for us. Okay, thank you. All right, so I think we're moving on. Next order, next order of business. If there's no further questions, we'll move on to the next order of business, which is to discuss sending in a letter in support of a mail-in election. Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, I believe this was a, an item brought up at the last meeting that the board wished to discuss. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I'm trying to, something's going, something's, go, oh, there we go. I'm trying to find you. <laughs> all of a sudden you, you, you all moved to a small little alien sized figure in the corner of my uh, computer. Yes, Mr. O'Neill, <laughs> you did bring this as a, um, as an issue that you wanted to address on your agenda. So please just, take it away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with everybody, we keep talking about this COVID-19 crisis and that, you know, uh, one of the uh, major concerns for a lot of people is uh, participating in their right to vote. So with the crisis, you know, it's imperative that we provide safe and accessible ways to vote. We, can't, we cannot and shouldn't force people to choose between their health and exercising their constitutional right to vote. To me, vote by mail is the most convenient and safest way for voters to participate. It will make early voting and election day voting safer and easier to administer for all those who choose to, to vote in person. So what I was asking previous meeting and asking tonight is that I think we should go on record and uh, encourage our state, you know, state legislators and, uh, and our federal legislators to adopt uh, a vote by mail uh, scenario so the people uh, will feel safe and more people can participate safely you know in our upcoming elections for this this next round of cycles of, uh, of events that's the primary in the in the november election and i just think it's important that uh, that we do that i mean right now people have an opportunity to vote by absentee ballot to, which is sort of a um an opt-in type of a procedure where you know they have to make an application and so on and give a reason why they're voting for absentee ballots and there's some proposals out there that would just say, you know, mail a ballot to everybody and let people opt out. And they opt out by not participating. And there are other proposals out there to um, have vote by mail without having to give a, a, a good reason that you're not going to be in town like you have to give now or to vote absentee and just you know, give them the option to do so. And there's a whole, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel here. There's several states that, that already do it already uh, and have been doing it successfully. And I know some of the arguments uh, against it are, you know, worried about fraud and uh, all the rest that goes along with it. But all of the uh, analysis that's been done over the last 20 years since Oregon first put it in place, um, it's, it's infinitesimal. You know, it's extremely small and slight. And actually, there's been more fraud with the regular ballot uh, process that's already in place than with the mail-in ballot uh, uh, proposals that are out there or the mail-in proposal, mail-in uh, ballot. Uh, methodology that's been employed in five different states. So to me, I just think it's uh, in timely. And again, I think it's uh, it's being considered in the legislature now. It's being considered in Congress now. And I think uh, at the local level, we should just weigh in and encourage encourage our uh, legislators to, to do the right thing and get most people have the opportunity to do it safely. Okay, members, have any questions i think when we talked about this too it was an issue of support behind local versus local and federal so uh let's just get some input of the of the membership on this mr walner um it's i've studied up on this a little bit the five states have had good luck uh, you know it's worked really well they have a tight bus system um again the fraud that steve mentions is is so small um it's never been verified that it's been abused in any way. And in fact, turnout has increased. And if Wisconsin had used it, people wouldn't have been waiting in line and uh, wouldn't have that uh, event that happened about a month ago when they were standing in line, you know, violating every social distancing rule we can think of. 
So I don't really see any problem with supporting the effort to get more people to participate and vote. I think it makes total sense, and I think we should write the letter. All right, Mr. Schultz. I'm fine with it on a town election, on a primary, that's fine. On a national election, I don't, I'm not for it. I think there is voter fraud. I think you'll have voters with the address of Riverside Cemetery voting. Um, it's a joke. I, I just don't think it's a good idea. I think the state's going to mandate, going to put the safeguards in place. We saw in our last presidential election, there was clearly not to get political. There was clearly an attempt to influence the election by an outside foreign power. We have no way to protect against that here in North Reading until we have protocols in place from the state to protect against those types of things. I don't think it's a good idea. The state's going to put it out. It's a state-run election. Let them put it out, tell us what to do. They will put the proper guidance in line. I don't think it's something we need to stick our nose in because I just don't think it's our place. But again, I support it on a town election. For the primary, that's fine. Um, hopefully by November, we're gonna be in a different place as a society. It won't be as much as an issue, but I don't know why we're getting involved in something that doesn't involve us. That, that's all. Okay, Mrs. Gonzalez. Uh, Locally, I have such faith in Barbara's staff. She runs a tight ship and I wouldn't even question it. Um, nationally, uh, I would be completely against it for many reasons. Um, and I think there are better ideas. Um, I sat in on a Mass Municipal Association Zoom meeting where they discussed drive up voting, um, much like the testing where you would drive up, get your ballot, um, and then give it to the next station. Um, that's what they were talking about and considering um, so that you could be physically there. Um, as far as standing in line, I mean, they're standing in line at Walmart. They're standing in line at the supermarket. You know, they can stand in line to vote too. Um, Ballots are lost. Ballots are fraudulent. I, I, I would not sign that letter nationally. That's, that's my feeling. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. I'm just wondering because it looks like we still have clerk staff here. If she would like to weigh in on it too, to just, it sounds like people have their minds fairly well made up on the issue. So I don't know, clerk staff, if you are here. She's got her hand raised. <laughs> with us. Oh, she does. Oh, she's okay. barbed now. <laughs> okay, that's great. Can we can we have her unmuted? Hello. Thank you. Hi, I didn't even see that. Hello. How are you, Madam Hi. Clerk? We, we wanted to yes. hear your input on this one. Well, um, as Mr. O'Leary said, there are a lot of um, pieces of legislation out there right now on this matter. And it's, there are a lot of issues involved with mail-out ballots. Um, you know, as, as has been mentioned, you know, we have to safeguard fraud. You don't want ballots, several ballots going to one household with several voters. And yet some of those voters may not be actually living in the household and ballots are there. There's really no way to know who might vote under those ballots. There's a lot of issues involved. We have in Massachusetts, we have inactive voters. Um, this would require ballots going to inactive voters blindly without knowing if they are in fact still in the community if they have registered elsewhere, whether it's within Massachusetts or in other states, they could be getting ballots in two locations. There are a lot of issues to cover with this. It's not as simple as just mail a ballot out to everybody. And we do wanna make sure that we protect, you know, the voters' rights. We wanna make sure it's done correctly. We wanna make sure that there is no fraud to question the outcome of the election. Um, I think that the legislators are going through a lot of options right now. And I really feel we need to see how they play out in this. Um, my association, the Clerks Association has had some input on it. 
And, you know, if we're going to find a way to do this, we have to make sure we find the right way and make it work. Um, the idea of uh, absentee voting, um, uh, having people state why they're requesting a ballot, we don't ask them to state it. The, you know, requirement under the law says there are several reasons, but already it's been expanded to allow the COVID situation to um, be one of the reasons that anyone can request an absentee ballot by mail or an early voted ballot. So we're certainly not trying to prevent people from, from voting. But the application process also is a safeguard, just, just so people know that that is a written affidavit. When people sign that, they're swearing under the pains and penalties of perjury that they are who they say they are. They are requesting the ballot. We have a paper trail where it goes to. So eliminating that process does open the um, whole mail out ballot situation to, you know, some degree of, of uh, questionability, perhaps, um, just in not having to safeguard these other states that have been doing it, have been doing it for a lot, a long time, but they had time to develop it and to put those safeguards in place. So we do need to watch out for that at this point. And there are bills out there that are addressing this. Um, so I would like to see where those go a little bit further. Thank you. I have a question for you. Do you see um, any difference? I mean, because elections to me, it requires the same level of, you know, diligence on your staff's part and your poll workers part, whether it's local or federal. So you might generate more voters, perhaps, in the, for the federal, according to the numbers, right? The federal draws out more voters than, uh, than little old us, right? A few. <laughs> it does. But the process and the procedures and the preparation and all of the other factors all take place uh, on an equal part, no matter what type of election it is. It is strictly the volume that, that differs. Um, but all of the laws and regulations are in place that are there for every election. The, um, when you initiate or open up mail out ballots to on the local level, as far as processing them, there have to be some considerations that change that. What happens now? Currently, we actually just you know um, bring all of the sealed ballots to the polls and process them there. Well, under these scenarios for mail out ballots, the volume, as I'm sure everybody would recognize, would be tremendous. So to say that now, in addition to checking in in person voters at the polls, we have to actually take these ballot envelopes, we check in the voter at the check-in station, we check out the voter at the check-out station, and then the ballots are opened en masse and without identifying the voters and cast in the machine. All that takes place on every single election in between in-person voters. So it's a tremendous effort on the part of wardens and clerks to administer that for a national election when we already have several hundred absentee voters and we have people waiting, as you say, in lines to vote in person. And the wardens and clerks, you know, are shuffling in between to check in their absentee lists and check them out and cast the ballots. Now you add in, you know, a, a, an open mail out ballot scenario and there have to be changes to the legislation or within the legislation that allow some sort of either processing um, in the office as the ballots come in without help doing any tabulating, but at least mm -hmm. processing those ballots in-house and not having to take them to the polls, put the burden on the wardens and clerks, in inconvenience any in-person voters, and be able to do this in a timely fashion to process thousands of ballots at the polls on election day, it just would be overwhelming to, to everybody. I don't, I, 
we're waiting to see how this pans out because this is one of the areas that's in some of the legislation. Okay, thank you for your input. Now, okay, we have a, a finger raised. Mrs. Hurlbut, <laughs> please. Yeah, uh, Barbara, I'm sure that you are already doing this and I haven't read uh, last week's transcript yet. And I, and I remember that there had been uh, some stuff in the press about the um, expanded uh, reasons oh, for yeah. absentee ballot. Yeah. Uh, and I believe that there are also a couple of ways you could approach it. Uh, will that be reprinted in the transcript because we're coming up on the local election any day now? The for the local election, Abby, or yeah, are you? Yeah. Saying, no, I'm for the local. I'm more concerned right now about the local election. Okay. Well, we do have that information up on the website, and it is, um, I believe, still up on the home page, even as a, a banner for people to click on to, so they can get quickly to um, that banner is evident, and then it takes you to. Um, our page, the town clerk's page, where we have that information. We have um, a quick cl click to get to an application for and mail in an absentee ballot or a mail in early voted ballot. Um, and yes, we will certainly have more um, information in the transcript. Maureen always puts in uh, the articles, you know, and information for the voters. So. Yeah, I'm more concerned about uh, perhaps some of the seniors that may not have connectivity, hence are not able to visit the town website. I think we need to get that information out there. Thank you. I would agree. <clears throat> okay, so but seniors, they can also call the, the clerk's office and make a request. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we can't take the request by telephone, but we can certainly help them. Yeah. Old fashioned way, pick up that phone and call. Um, but, uh, I, okay, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, Barbara, in, in the last federal election, generally, what's, what's the rate of absentee ballot voting? You're not threatening. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think. I would say we probably, if we were saying there were 10,000, voters then i think there were about eleven thousand voters um probably um, this is a, a wild guess but i'm going to say about 600 to 700 absentee ballots so six percent or less yeah okay it Just, was also early voting so right but yeah, it, okay. it was and that was a tremendous um, right. We had, I think, 35, almost 35 percent of the voters uh, participated in early voting. So, in, in the last two federal elections, about one in four people, Americans, cast their ballots by uh, by mail. There were five states: uh, Colorado, Hawaii, Oregon, and Utah, or Washington. Mailing ballots has been the primary method of voting. In 28 additional states. All voters have had the right to vote by mail if they choose, without having to provide any reason or excuse. So over time, a growing number of voters have chosen that option, right? So since 2000, more than 250 million votes have been cast via mail-out ballots in all 50 states. In 2018, more than 31 million Americans cast their ballots by mail, 25.8% of the election participants. Despite the dramatic increase in mailing, mail voting over time, fraud rates remain infinitesimally small. None of the five states that hold their elections primarily by mail has had any voter fraud scandals since making the change. States that use vote by mail have encountered essentially zero fraud. So uh, Oregon, I think they had uh, since over 100 million ballots since 2000, has documented only about a dozen cases of, of, <clears throat> over, the, over the 20 years. So one of the things, Barbara, that you expressed concern about is, you know, duplicate ballots and stuff. A lot of the states have instituted barcodes. So most uh, election jurisdictions now use some form of barcode on their ballot envelopes. The barcodes allow election officials uh, to keep track of the ballot processing and help voters know whether the ballot has been received. And barcodes also allow states to identify and eliminate duplicate ballots if a voter casts more than one vote. 
either mistakenly or corruptly. But anyway, I just think again, getting back to the basic question here is, you know, it's the time for <clears throat> to move into the 21st century and just uh, get something well, going. I you know, and I think, and I think at the local level, um, I think it's important for us to give the feedback to our legislators that it's important at both state and national levels to provide people the easiest and safest way to participate in democracy. So, um, you know, local level, you know, we can handle our own business here, that's fine. But I think uh, we should be able to, here in Massachusetts, um, you know, join the vast majority of other states, 28 other states that at least no excuses needed, and uh, the other five states that mail a ballot to everybody and let people opt out, not have to opt in. Don't make it difficult. It shouldn't be difficult for people to participate. And again, it, I think you, enough I have, I have to, place, so. the, the process really isn't difficult. And, and whether the board chooses to send a letter or not, I mean, that's, that's their wish. You know, I have concerns on the other end of administrating, you know, mm -hmm. any kind of mail-in process the right way. We do not question anyone who requests an absentee ballot. The loss has, there are three specific reasons. And now that in every piece of legislation I've seen, that is being expanded to allow the COVID-19 to be one of those reasons. And that's just to allow people to actually apply and be within the law. But do we question anyone? Absolutely not. And with the implementation of early voting by mail, there is no reason required to request an early voted ballot by mail. So it is a very open and easy process. I, I just want to clear that up for all the voters. It really, there's no hindrance to voting by mail right now. Um, but the other statistic or the processes that you, you say, I get that and I understand that you could implement barcodes and things like that, but you also have to have the computer system and the computer technology ready for that type of um, uh, administration. And right now that would require probably an overhaul of the central voter system, which is already antiquated. It's already 25 years old and they've been talking about um, uh, changing it over totally. And these are the, the processes that would be required to do that. My comment about um, a, a single person voting duplicate you, if you're scanning a barcode, I mean, if you have four envelopes going to one household and there are only two voters left in that household because the kids graduated from college and they're off now to another state for their jobs, but you've sent four ballots to one household. Those are just concerns. As an election official, as the administrator of elections, those are things that I think about. So um, I just want to make it clear. For anybody who's listening, the voting by mail process, as it exists now, there are really no hindrances to it at all. So it is a very easy and direct process. It, yes, requires an application, um, and, and that's as simple as it gets. So um, I, I understand, and I, I know changes are going to come, in, and I'm not saying they shouldn't for certain. I just want to be sure that we have the safeguards in place that we have the way to administer it properly, that we have the support that we need to do this and, and make it successful. That's, that's the ultimate goal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we need to move on on this issue at this point. We have, uh, we have um, at least two members that are in favor of sending a letter for both state and federal. We have two members that are in favor of sending a letter for I mean, uh, not state and federal, local and, fed, and federal. Two members that are not in favor of that, but in favor of sending a letter for local. Um, and I can certainly break the tie and just say, as a consensus, we all agree we can send a letter in favor of local. So let's do that. Let's move on with this topic. I think we're going to wait and see. We have to wait and see for most of it anyway. Um, there's a there's going to be implementation process if they do ultimately implement the law. Uh, or pass the law, they'll have these implementation procedures in place just like they put in place for early voting that, you know, Barbara has to comply with all kinds of 
requirements for early voting, and that seems to work out well. Um, but I think we need to we need to just move on. We can send a letter for local if that's the majority majority rule, or unless you have changed your mind. I see Mrs. Gonzalez shaking her head. Did you change your mind about what you wanted to do? Yeah, I, I wasn't really saying I wanted to send a letter. I was just saying that I would have utmost confidence in Barbara um, if if we had to have a mail-in voting. I don't I don't really see that it's necessary. Like she just covered, <laughs> you already can mail in. You already can do that. I don't feel there's a letter necessary to ask for it. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Mr. Studo has his hand up. Mr. Studo. Uh, this is a question really hasn't, it, it pertains to this, but it's not about this debate about the letter. Um, uh, Mr. Stats, in, in general, let's say you were overwhelmed. So let's say something, let's say you're overwhelmed in a federal election. Is there a, like a time limit where, so for example, you know, we do all do vote by mail in November for the presidential one. Is there a point where Massachusetts has to like, I don't know if, if you want to use the word ratify or confirm or their votes before, you know, for example, if North Reading after three days after the election date still didn't have it, do votes start not to count? Like, is there like a time limit? All votes that are cast have to be um, completed uh, on election evening with the exception of overseas ballots if they're mailed out. Um, in that case, all ballots that are mailed out to another country have to be postmarked by election night and received within the 10th day after a state election. Other than that, every absentee ballot has to be tabulated by election evening. Every early voted ballot is tabulated by election evening. With the um, implementation of early voting, even all those thousands of ballots that we encountered um, in the last two uh, state elections, they're transported. We, all we're doing is entering them in the computer system on a day-by-day -day basis. They are physically transported to the polls. We have a whole set of different election workers who process those because the regular poll workers are processing all of the other absentee ballots. So it can be a, a very overwhelming situation when you're talking about all of these issues. If we have a big turnout for early voting again, and the legislation that's out there is expanding early voting for both the state primary and the state election by one week each. Um, so that will generate quite a few more ballots. So again, if we're all we're doing is storing them in our vault, and then on election day, we have to transport them to the polls and process them there. It is, an, it could be a very overwhelming situation. And that's why I say there needs to be other factors taken into any legislation that account for how we can pro better process these in a timely fashion to make sure that our results are done by election evening with the exception of those ballots that are mailed out of the country and we're waiting for their return, which is a small number, um, if oh, any. Sure. Thank you, thank you. We, need, we do need to move on and what, what clerk, clerk staff means when she says processing is literally the poll workers have to process those through the ballot machines in between voters voting. So. It, it actually has to go, each and every one of them has to go through the, the ballot machine individually. So, That's okay, correct. so let's move on with this. We really have to move on now. It's, a, it's almost 11 o'clock. We're almost to the end of our agenda. So the question on the agenda is, do we want to send a letter in support of this? We definitely don't have a consensus on federal elections. Um, I don't, I'm not even sure if we have, we had Mr. O'Leary was in favor of sending a letter for both, Mr. Walnut was in favor of sending a letter for both, Mrs. Gonzalez does not think it's necessary, Mr. Schultz, what's your, uh, did you yes. change your mind or, no, what's I that, I'm sorry. sorry, you don't think it's all right, so let's, uh, I don't, I, I, I would, I would actually 
agree and defer to clerk staff. I think we need to wait and see what the legislature does with this one. And it'll probably be very instructive on how, how we're, uh, how we do move forward. So uh, I think it's unfortunate, okay. Madam Chair, that we don't want to provide safe and accessible uh, means to vote. And I think it's not Again, that, I, I that's don't think it's the that same thing. I don't that's think the same easy. thing as saying we don't want to be safe with plastic bags. I think that's absurd to suggest that. I think the there's no is reason. There's no reason to suggest that our elections aren't safe. And you just heard the clerk say people are able to get an absentee va ballot to vote, and COVID-19 is another basis for them to do that. And that we're waiting on legislation. So it's to suggest that we're not providing a safe. A means of voting is is as well, silly as suggesting, suggesting that, that we're not waiting with the plastic bag ban. I'm suggesting that we're deferring and letting someone else decide what our opinion is in relation to providing uh, the most safe and accessible way to vote. It's Robin, 11 o'clock. But it's going on? to happen anyway, but by letter. So let's move on, folks. We're, we're moving moving along, and our next order of business is. Um, the town administrator's report. Mr. Gilberto, we could hear you closing your computer. Do you still have your report available? I did not have a written report. My, my computer has not been closed. It's very much active. Uh, but Madam Chair, we are joined by the water superintendent. We are joined by the water superintendent this evening. He's been very patient, hopefully tending to other business at home while he's been on the call. Mark, are you there? Yes, I am. Mark, thanks very much for hanging on here. I asked Mark to come on in the meeting just to give the community and the board an update relative to a notice that our residents received last week concerning an issue relating to our water um, here in town. Mark, could you just give a quick description of what the, what happened, what that notice was? Sure, so we mailed out a, uh, it was a public notice relative to total trihalomethane um, if you recall, we had a similar notice for us in February. Likely what will happen is just based on how the legislation is, or the regulations are written is the same notice will go out again in the July, August time frame. Um, so trihalomethanes are formed when you add chlorine to drinking water that has any type of organic in it. Uh, all water systems have some level of trihalomethanes in them. Um, back in January, and it really was looked at as an average split order. And based on that, we had to send the notice out in February. Again, we had to send it out this month. So the, the, the uh, average you look at is 80 parts per billion. The most recent test is 45 parts per billion. So even though the level is well below the, the standard at this point, it's an average of four prior quarters that, that caused this notice to have to go out. We are talking very uh, in depth with the state. The state is issuing us a permit, basically add chlorine to the water. So we're having a little bit of an issue. You know, and again, we're giving you a permit to add chlorine to the water, knowing that you have an issue with the PHM. So we're uh, just going through it, uh, some of the some protocols, test more often, um, make sure we're not overflowing. So we obviously want to add enough chlorine so that we don't have any type of bacteria growing out in the system. And that's kind of it's kind of a balancing act, and I know I've explained this before that the water systems um, walk where they're trying to add enough chlorine to prevent again bacterial growth, but not add too much chlorine, they causing these THM. It's kind of where we are right now. Um, so we're working with the state. We're looking very closely at those uh, the temporary and then the permanent chlorine stations come online. The thinking is, and the logic to it is that. It should be less THM formation rechlorinating the and over water than there would be by chlorinating our own well water. Um, there should not be a lot of remaining organic, un, you know, unchlorinated organic matter in the water coming in from and over. It's already passed through their whole system. So logically, it should come down. We just want to do sufficient testing as we go online to, uh, to demonstrate that that actually is the case. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? All set. Mark, thank you very much. Thank you for your stewardship of our, our water supply and for your uh, for staying on tonight to give us a quick update. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Mr. Gilberto, anything else in your report that you 
think no, we ma'am. should hear. All right. No, nothing further. Good. We're going to old and new business. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, we've covered the old and the new. We're all set. <laughs> all right. Mr. Walner. All set. Thank you. Mr. Schultz. Moving right along. <laughs> Gonzalez. Stay healthy, everybody. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to adjourn by Mr. Schultz. Second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Schultz. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And I vote aye. Thank you folks for hanging in there with us. Good night.